All right, everybody, welcome. Good to see you, good to have you. Glad you're back. This is uh, lesson seven. We're looking at the Holy Golivadi's fathers, and this is, we're coming up to the 18th century in our trek through history uh, as it pertains to the Holy Church and the doctrine and the dogma of the church, especially as it pertains to the issues facing the church today uh, surrounding. Uh, the pan heresy of ecumenism and the doctrine of the church, which is, of course, uh, so important for our own salvation. So this is what we're doing here tonight, and we're going to be looking also briefly at St. Hilarion Trotsky and a few things he has to say. And also uh, we'll try to get to Father George Flosky, but I doubt it. I don't think we're going to be able to, 95% uh, sure. So uh we will pick him up next week god willing very important to understand father george's uh, contribution and so that's not uh it's not going to be forgotten we'll we'll stick to it uh so this is going to be going deep because the holy fathers on the holy mountain the kolivadis fathers dealt uh with um with great um care and intensity with the matters of faith, matters of of, of, uh, of the dogma and the boundaries of the church, both because it was necess necessary in their work, especially St. Nicodemus Mostahegra, as we'll talk about, but also because there was a pastoral, immediate pastoral need uh, that was facing the church. So we will um, we'll delve in. I hope you can follow along and uh, you can always go back and look and Submit your questions as well. You don't, uh, you're not able to uh, follow uh, some of our our points and our, our and all the rest. So let's get started. Let's say our prayers, and uh, we'll jump right into it. So first of all, we'll say the prayer, and then we'll chant the Tripari. Illumine our hearts, O Master, who lovest mankind with the pure light of the divine knowledge. Open the eyes of our mind to the understanding of the gospel teachings. Let us also fear of thy blessed commandments to jump down all carnal desires. We may have the spiritual men of living, both think, thinking and doing such things as are well pleasing unto thee. For thou art the illumination of our souls and bodies, O Christ our God. Under thee we ascribe glory, together with thy Father, who is without from everlasting. And all holy, good, and life creating spirit, both now and ever, and unto the ages of ages. Amen. Kata pemsa safti so pnevma do angi onke di afton di niku meni sagi nevsas filantrope doksansi. Amin. Amin. <clears throat> All right. So let's go right into it with our Holy Fathers and their sayings. This is, again, an Orthodox Christology called Ivani's Father, St. Hilarion Trotsky, and we'll probably get the Father George Swarovski next week. Uh, you can see on the left here the icon of, of the Holy Fathers that uh, the Choros, the, the choir of the Kolivadis Fathers, quite a, quite a lot of them are considered Kolivadis. Although there is a core group which we're going to look at, which are mainly responsible for the ecclesiological reflections that we're going to be examining. Uh, but let's look at who is in this choir of, of saints, uh, the Kolivadis fathers, these pillars of orthodoxy. So, first of all, you may not know that we have a day dedicated to their celebration and the service in Greek. I don't think it exists in English. Maybe it does. Uh, it's um, the bright Saturday after the Feast of Pascha. We commemorate all the Holy Fathers 
of the Kolivadi's movement. Let's just go through them really quick. Neophytos Kafsokalivitis, who is considered the initiator of the movement of the group of holy fathers who were working. Now you got to remember the context, historical context here. This is the 18th century. This is the time that is perhaps the the the, the most intense in terms of Western heterodox propaganda and proselytism in the Orthodox East. It's also a time of great Westernization that's going on in especially Russia uh, under Peter the Great and Catherine the Great. And, and so there's a lot of pressure going on that's been building for decades and even for centuries uh, for the Orthodox to simulate culturally, politically with the West. Now, of course, a lot of Orthodox are underneath the Ottoman Empire and the Turks, so they're looking to the West already in hope on a political level of some kind of eventual freedom from the Turkish yoke. So there's a, just a tremendous amount of pressure and a lot of things going on to, 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 of course, the enemy of our salvation is working to undermine the holy tradition. And so there, when we talk about a movement, we should not be mistaken and think this is some kind of renovationist or renewal movement. We don't have, really don't have those things in the Orthodox Church. What we have is a continuation of the Holy Fathers, and there are definitely members or even local churches that can veer off and become more infected by the world or by the heterodox mentality of the day, uh, but there are always Holy Fathers who stand and, as it were, call people back to the, uh, to the, to the path uh, uh, of salvation, uh, even if they're in the church. So there's this struggle going on always uh, against secularization and against the uh, non-orthodox heterodox uh, mentality, and so these the, these these holy fathers on Monathos who are continuing, of course, the holy tradition of the fathers and the ascetics from Saint Gregory Palamas a few centuries earlier, uh, and all the saints up until their day. Neophytos lived from 1689 to 1784, so it gives you a time period of the beginner one of the first, and then we have really all the way into the late 19th uh, century, we have those who are considered Kolivadi's fathers. Uh, another great uh, and important figure is Venerable, the Venerable uh, Saint Athanasius of, Par of Paros, the Parios, uh, 1722 to 1813, so almost the entire 18th, 18th century. Much of, much of the of the events that we're going to talk about and the things that are going to be discussed tonight are going, going to take place from the almost exactly in the middle of the century, 1750, all the way through the end and to the early 1800s, 1810. Uh, St. Barrio is considered a teacher of the nation, the, the people in this part of the world, the Greek speaking people in this part of the world, uh, and a, a very erudite and learned man who wrote a number of texts. One of them on the uh, Western Enlightenment and philosophy, uh, which, if God wills and we we have the manpower, we will translate into English eventually. It's our goal. Of course, Saint Cosmas Atelos, also during this time period, a renewal going from Mount Athos and 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 preaching and teaching throughout the uh, uh, the, the nation here. Uh, country of what, what will become the country of Greece after the revolution. Uh, and um, Makarios Notaras, uh, one of the great family, of the Roman uh, descendant of the great family of Romans who uh, were in, in the uh, Senate. Uh, he was the Archbishop of Corinth just for a few years, actually. Most of his life was spent as an ascetic in Chios and other places on uh, Mount Athos and working with St. Nicodemus, the Hagurite in bringing us all of these wonderful uh, additions and texts that we have, which we'll mention in a moment. Uh, so he was uh, a bishop, the, the only major figure of the Kolibadi's fathers besides St. Nectarios of Egina, later on, who was a bishop, uh, and uh, very important, his uh, patronage to the movement, I think, uh, for, for a variety of reasons. Uh, St. Nikiforos of Hios, uh, the Venerable Godbearer Nifon, the new, uh, 1736 to 1809, uh, who uh, was a um, Cenobite and uh, a great monastic father, a holy uh, new higher martyr Parthenios, 
1805, he was martyred. Um, Cyril, the new of Paros, a bit later <clears throat> than uh, St. Uh, Athanasius. St. Athanasius spent most of his later part of his life in, in Hios, never went back to Paros. St. Cyril uh, was an amazing wonder worker. As you see on the screen here, just a few things about him. Endowed with the gift of foresight and with the ability to work miracles, he made the sign of the cross over a snake and it died. He traveled on his monastic ca cassock, which he spread out on the sea. He struck a rock in the arid monastery of St. George and gushed forth uh, spring, gushed forth, which is still running to this day. Just a few of the amazing things that associated with that. Say a lot of a lot of a lot of these saints are unknown to most people in the West, uh, even Orthodox. So it's very good to have this opportunity to bring them and showcase them. Saint Pais Velishkovsky, who's very important, and we're going to do a, a, a future podcast, uh, which will include a lot of very interesting and wonderful information about Saint Paisios. Of course, he lived on the Holy Mountain, and then he went to Moldavia, and he started the, the tremendous monastic movement. In, uh, in in Romania, which then ended up through translation work to reach Russia, and really was the spring which for which which bring uh, helped bring forth the great flowering of monastic life in the 19th century in Russia, especially in Optina and other places where they were translating uh, the books that he had brought uh, into Russian from Slavonic and and, and publishing them. So uh, Saint Paisius also plays a role here in tonight's uh, presentation. Uh, Saint the Holy Colivadis uh, Gapios and Porfirios, uh, Arsenios of Paros a little bit later in the 19th century, Parthenios of Hios again a bit later, but definitely in the tradition of the Colivadis. Uh, we said in the Saint Nectarios, many people don't consider him a Colivadis, but actually he's coming very much in the tradition of those same Holy Fathers, Saint Nicholas Planas, and Saint Savas the New of Kalimnos, another great saint, ascetic. Uh, in the early 20th century. So this is the considered the, the choir of the Holy Fathers, uh, uh, the Holy Kulivadi's fathers. Now let's let's just talk about four of them that are particularly important for our interpretation of the canons and our understanding of the, the questions at stake in terms of ecclesiology. We talked about Neophytos Kafsoka Livitis, who was the initiator of the movement. Just a few words about him. He was the first head of Athoniada, which is a school that was established in the mid nineteenth in the mid eighteenth uh, century on Mount Athos uh, during the dark period of Turkish uh, persecution and restriction of education. And he was succeeded by uh, other renowned figures, including Saint Athanasius of Paros, who later became the head. Uh, in uh, of, of the same school. Uh, he was the author of the first version or a version of On Frequent Communion, which is a very important text that came out of this period. Uh, and he, he traveled quite a bit and, and taught after leaving the Holy Mountain, being persecuted and being driven away and slandered because of his uh, confession of the faith uh, by the anti Kolivadis, uh, the westernized, uh, generally speaking, westernized and 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 uh, infected with something similar to the Barlamian uh, in, uh, perception of things. Uh, that's that's the only way you can explain their 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 dedicated war against all of the Kolivadis fathers on Mount Athos. And uh, he spent the lot, most of his life, the end of his life, in uh, Romania teaching there. Now, also Saint Athanasius Paros, or, or Saint Athanasius Parios, uh, he was highly educated, a renowned teacher and defender, and went to school in in Smyrna and on Athos, and uh, I think in Constantinople. He was asked to teach in Constantinople, but declined. He was asked to take up take up the main school there. Uh, he wasn't ordained until he was fifty five years old. He spent much of his first years uh, in academia. He taught uh, after Athoniada in Thessaloniki and then in Chios, and he died at the age of 90, one of the oldest uh, of, the, of the fathers. Uh, St. Macarius of Corinth, we mentioned. Uh, again, he just spent a few years and then was a ascetic scholar and supporter of St. Nicodemus and the Contifadis fathers, responsible for some very important texts that we'll talk about momentarily. St. Bais Veroskovsky, the Slavic voice of the Contifadis. 
uh, very much in the tradition of the uh, Flokalia. Of course, he was the translator and in, in many ways originator of the text in the Slavic world. And he was the, the great renowned elder and spiritual father in Romania. And he was importantly, we'll get to this probably in a, in a separate podcast. I wish I could have gotten to tonight, but it's just too much. He was a co-worker of Dorotheos Vulismas, Vulismas, uh, who was the great supporter of the Kolibadi's fathers. And we'll talk about him because he's been brought up recently uh, through some research that some academics have done, and they've uh, brought to bear some interesting points, which some of them are mistaken, and we're going to correct those. Uh, St. Nicodemus the Hagurite, of course, the boast and glory of the Orthodox Church is Monk, Monk Moses, uh, the recently reposed uh, but well-known uh, writer in Monathos put it, he wrote many texts on the Holy Fathers and Manathos. Uh, you can see here the three volumes that we published in English by St. Nicodemus, his Eximologitarian, his Confession uh, of Faith, and his Concerning Frequent Communion, all of those which we hope to bring out again in circulation very soon. It's been much too long uh, out of circulation. Uh, if you count up everything that he wrote and did in all the versions, it's about 100 works, uh, which is Pretty phenomenal if you consider that he only lived 60 years. And so he was only really producing 30 of those years. He became a monk, I think, in around his late 20s and uh, so uh, in mid 20s. And so, you know, just a tremendous, an amazing amount of work in such a short amount of time. Uh, some of the major works that we should all be familiar with, or most of us should be familiar with, most of these texts is the Philokalia, of course, the Evergetinos, very important text for monastics and lay people for the spiritual life, collection of desert fathers, uh, sayings, and teachings, concerning free communion, which you mentioned, the works of St. Simeon, new theologian, very important. Uh, anybody who says that the that St. Nicodemus was westernized, just do not understand what's going on in the, in the 18th century and what he's all about. I mean, anybody who can bring all these works to bear, the Philokalia, the the uh, uh, works of St. Simeon Theologian, St. Gregory Palamas, which he, he unfor unfortunately was lost, but he did, he did the works of St. Gregory Palamas. I mean, such, such, a, such a figure, such a powerhouse, spiritual powerhouse, obviously is not going to be taken in by the various the errors of the West. And, and we have to understand what he's doing and where he's working in the context. And then we can very easily explain why some things come across as, as Western or as scholastic. Eximologitarian, uh, Theotokarion, a uh, collection of, uh, for the Mother of God, prayers that are used in church on Manathos and all around the world. Unseen warfare, uh, numeral theology, spiritual exercises, uh, the um, complete works, uh, of, as I said, Trangiri Palamas, the Christoethia, which was translated as the Christian morality, uh, which is, exists in English now, uh, Ephcologia in the Garden of Graces, the Dialogues of Barsanufius, the, the Synaxarian, all the volumes of the Synaxarian, just an amazing amount of work. Uh, the uh, uh, Alphabeto, uh, Alphabetos, <laughs> I can't pronounce that, of St. Meletius, the neo Eclogion and Yortodromion and the New Ladder and the on and on and on. It goes on and on. Just an amazing, amazing, unique saint in the history of the church. Again, the boast and the glory of the Orthodox Church. And so we're going to see why his 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 views on the whole question of ecclesiology and baptism are so important to the church and why it, it's debated. Right? People want to claim him for, for themselves, their own position, but it's no question, William. There's no doubt about his position on these topics, as we'll see tonight. Now, a little background to what's going on in the, in the middle of the century. And uh, our fathers, the Kolivadis fathers, fathers, are not necessarily dependent on or even involved directly very much in this first uh, uh, controversy in the middle of the century surrounding the decisions of Pat Patriarch Cyril V of Constantinople. Uh, but the, the, they're, it's an important backdrop to what they're, what they're doing in teaching. They were dealing with this after the fact. Certainly, St. Nicodemus 
uh, in the 18 uh, in the 1780s. So 35 years later, he's writing his uh, Pedalion, is uh, the book, the rudder, which we the collection of canons, which is which one of the most important uh, things he did. Uh, and um, uh, but it's important to understand the historical context. So Patriarch Kirill, and it's a very important decision that was that was reached. Patriarch Kirill was opposed by many bishops due to his effort to end excess and to send them back to their sees. There was this bad practice of bishops spending a lot of time in the in Constantinople and not being in their difficult posts throughout uh, what was now the Ottoman Empire. And so this was a Essentially, a corruption. There was uh, there was ease and comfort, maybe, and and political uh, agendas that were being carried out. And so, he on two occasions uh, forcefully sent the bishops who were in Constantinople back to their sees. And so he had, for this and other reasons, he had some of those bishops against him. And he, he and he was very bold uh, in his decisions. And he created a lot of enemies, which is not surprising, given that he what what he ended up doing, as we'll see, due due to both an increase in the pro, proselytistic uh, activities of the Latins and the eventually um, the pro, Protestants in the nineteenth century, uh, their and their ever furthering departure from the typos or the form of baptism, surreal sought to enforce a crivia. And he wanted a decision uh, after a variety of historical events brought this again to the fore uh, for a, a clear decision of, of the Orthodox to return to crivia and enforce baptism across the board for all the papal and reformed Protestants. Uh, he dissolved the anti-patriarchal synod in his second stint, again, the second time, and sent the bishops once again to their diocese, and then together with Matthew and Parthenios, patriarchs of Alexandria and Jerusalem, who were also in the capital city, issued the Oros, which required all converts, papal Protestants especially, this is mainly who he's talking about, first and foremost, although it follows that the Reformed Protestants would also be in this, to be baptized. And this decision constitutes the authorized practice of the great church of christ the ecumenical patriarchate on this question officially in force to this day now some have brought up and said well the patriarch of constantinople doesn't do this anymore in fact they're doing very uh problematic and questionable practices of chrismation for protestants across the board without any real uh dis distinctions being made in practice that is the case and it's a it's a tragedy but Officially speaking, in other words, synodical decisions, there's been no synodical decision since that to overturn it, which is uh, both quite amazing and very instructive for us. Uh, it is, as I said in an earlier lecture, uh, the basis upon which the Holy Fathers of Mount Athos re re rebuked the, uh, the, uh, the bishops sent from the Patriarchate when they baptized uh, the famous uh, abbot in uh, well-known abbot in from France, Pierre, uh, Father Placid, and his uh, monastic brotherhood, they were baptized as Simono Petra, and 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 a lot of reaction uh, came forth when that was well, became known in the in the in the West, and so Patriarchate was under pressure to send an exarchate there and to pressure the monks not to baptize, but the fathers did not back down and have not backed down to this day. And they cited this decision, which they said rightfully, and as Bishop, Bishop Carlisto Swear has also uh, noted in his uh, his uh, essay on uh, the question of baptism of uh, heterodox, he notes that this is the official position. And he laments it, uh, for he has uh, changed his position over the years, but this, uh, this is the case. And so, uh, let's look at this decision. We're going to read it quickly um, and maybe even jump some some lines here, but you have access to it. You can read it on your own. It's online as well. Uh, it's in the book. Uh, by the way, one of the books, the main book I'm using tonight uh, for a lot of the material is this book here. If you can see that. Get, I Confess One Baptism uh, by Father George Metalinos. Uh, it's now out of print, but maybe God willing, 
it will be able to get it back into print. Uh, Father George Metalinos, the dean of the theological school in Athens, is reported reposed now, uh, but he was a major uh, patristic figure in the last 40 years of Orthodox since the 70s, 80s, and 90s, especially in the 2000s. He reposed just last was it last year, two years ago now, a year and a half ago. Just time about Elder Ephem reposed. And um, one of my teachers, uh, supporters uh, in my doctoral thesis, uh, one of the most important figures in Greek Orthodoxy in the last 30 years, for sure, 40 years, uh, and a follower of the Holy Fathers and a, and a presenter of the, the teachings of the Kolivadis Fathers. Uh, so we're going to be using uh, this book, which has a lot of wonderful information for our, for our presentation tonight. So let's read through quickly the Oros and, and the decision, and that's what that means, the decision or the boundaries that they had laid down for uh, the church uh, with regard to the heterodox. Many are the means by which we attain salvation, and these, so to speak, in a ladder-like fashion are interlinked and interconnected, all aiming at one and the same end. See that, how the unity of the mysteries is, is immediately, first and foremost, put forward. What was lost in the West and why they ended up with a piecemeal, confused understanding of initiation. Uh, we have a unity of the mysteries, unity from the beginning and the initiation. All three mysteries are a part of the initiation process for everyone. And he said, and it says, first of all, is the baptism which God delivered to the sacred apostles, such being the case that without it, the rest are ineffectual. For it says, unless one is born of water and the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. The first manner of generation brought man into this mortal existence. It was therefore imperative and necessary so that another more mystical manner of generation be found, neither beginning in corruption nor terminating therein, whereby it would be possible for us to imitate the author of our salvation, the Lord Jesus Christ, for the baptismal water in the font takes the place of a womb, and there is birth for him who is born. As Chrysostom says, while the spirit which descends on the water, he has the uh, water, he has he the place of God who fashions the embryo. And just as he was placed in the tomb and on the third day returned to life, so likewise they who believe, going under the water instead of under the earth, in three immersions depict in themselves the three day grace of the resurrection the water being sanctified by the descent of the Holy Spirit, so that the body might be illumined by the water, which is visible, and the soul might receive sanctification by the Spirit, which is invisible. Wonderfully put, beautifully put. This is so rich. Uh, I continue. For just as water in a cauldron partakes of the heat of the fire, so the water in the font, in the font should be font there, is likewise transmuted by the action of the Holy Spirit into divine power. It cleanses those who are thus baptized and makes them worthy of adoption as sons. Not so, however, with those who are initiated in a different manner. Instead of cleansing and adoption, it renders them impure and sons of darkness. So before we go to the second slide, which we'll continue on, let's note here, how in this presentation, this theology, which is the orthodox understanding, how important the water is. This is not some something we just secondary element and you can put a little on the forehead or on the toes or over the head, hair and it doesn't matter if it actually immerses you. The whole imagery here, the theology here is very clear <clears throat> that one is as if in a womb, they're, they're they're immersed in this reality. They're covered by this reality. They're dying and rising with Christ like the resurrection. It's all here. Uh, and so it, it, it's meant to lead us, and it, as it should, to the very clear conclusion that the immersions are essential. Let's go on. Just three years ago, the question arose. When heretics come over to us, are their baptisms acceptable? given that these are administered contrary to the tradition of the Holy Apostles and Divine Fathers and contrary to the custom and ordinance of the Catholic and Apostolic Church. We, who by divine mercy were raised in the Orthodox Church 
and who adhere to the canons of the sacred apostles and divine fathers recognize only one church, our Holy Catholic and Apostolic Church. It is her mysteries and consequently her baptism that we accept. On the other hand, we abhor by common resolve all rites not administered as the Holy Spirit commanded the sacred apostles and as the Church of Christ performs to this day. For they are the inventions of depraved men and we regard them as strange and foreign to the whole apostolic tradition. Therefore, we receive those who come over to us from them as unholy and unbaptized. In this, we follow our Lord Jesus Christ, who commanded his disciples to baptize in the name of the Father and the Son of the Holy Spirit. And we follow the sacred and divine apostles, who order us to baptize aspirants with three immersions and immersions. And in each immersion to say one name of the Holy Trinity. We follow the sacred Dionysios, peer of the apostles, who tells us, quote, to dip the aspirant stripped of every garment three times in a font containing sanctified water and oil, having loudly proclaimed the threefold hypostasis of the divine blessedness and straightway to seal the newly baptized with the most divine potent miron or chrism and thereafter to make him a participant in the super sacramental Eucharist. And we follow the second and Penthecti, holy ecumenical councils, which order us to receive as unbaptized those, and before I go on, note here the stress we follow, absolutely essential. We follow the Holy Fathers, we follow the apostles, we follow the teachings of the great Dionysius, we follow our Lord's teachings. Note that the presupposition in the beginning point here is our ecclesiology is a given. It's not a for the debate. We're not discussing the question of ecclesiology here. We're, discuss, we're discussing the what what flows from our ecclesiology, which is our pastoral uh, uh, theology and our uh, econ the economy of salvation. But the we start from ecclesiology. We move there. We don't go the other way. We don't look at our practice and then figure out who we are. We don't look at our practice and figure out what the church is. We, we know what the church is. We live the church. It's one holy Catholic and apostolic church. There's no other church. It's one body. And, and, and the mysteries are inseparable from this body. There's, there, there are no mysteries outside this body. It's the one mystery and all the mysteries are connected. So these are some of the basics here in this confession, this, 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 this decision, which are not up to debate. There's no no one discussing, well, is this really the case? Are we really the church? Or is there really mysteries uh, only in the church? Is it uh, uh, is it this the, is this really the way we do things? The, none of this is up to debate, obviously. Uh, the question of, was not whether this was questionable. The question was wh what is, and, and on what basis is economy possible? All right, that's a different question. So let's continue. We follow the second and Penthecti Holy Ecumenical Council. Penthecti is the Trullo and Trullo Council, or the uh, the council that is essentially laying down, laying down the canons for the Sixth Ecumenical Council. Uh, and we follow these councils, which order us to receive as unbaptized those aspirants to orthodoxy who are not baptized with three immersions and immersions. Very important point here, which will be taken up by the Holy Vadis Fathers and is. Uh, been followed as again as I, as as we've said both officially but also by the saints all the saints of the Kolibadis followed this teaching and in each immersion did not loudly evoke one of the divine hypotheses but were baptized in some other fashion all right so he's saying look the way they've they've gone about doing whatever they're doing among the heterodox has has brought them into uh, alienation from even the form even the type uh, and so we have, following Dionysios, following the Holy Ecumenical Councils, and they specifically have in mind the Canon 7, which we're going to discuss tonight, uh, which says for those, the Eunomians in particular, who only have one immersion, do not have the threefold immersion, they must be baptized. So they're saying, look, we're following the Holy Ecumenical Councils. And the Penthecti, which has the same canon, which is slightly uh, um slightly added to and, and changed. So the, they're referring to these two basic canons of the church on this matter. And they're saying we're following those by 
insisting on baptism for the uh, Latin slash papal Protestants who are coming over because they have abandoned the inseparable type or form which it cannot be divided or separated from the theology and the faith, which is which is also uh, uh, seen and experienced in the baptism of the church. He, they go on. We too, therefore, adhere to these divine and sacred decrees, and we reject and abhor baptisms belonging to heretics, for they disagree with and are alien to the divine apostolic dictate. They are useless waters, as Saint Ambrose and Saint Athanasius the Great said. They gave. They give no sanctification to such as receive them, nor avail at all to the washing away of sins. There are some unfortunate souls that are coming in from the Orthodox Church today, young and old in America and other places, who are marshalling quotes from Western fathers either uh, much later than these, these decisions or in, con in contradiction to these decisions. St. Athanasius, St. Ambrose, these councils, and ignoring not only the ancient fathers, but the, 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 the fathers of the second millennium on the whole, on the whole topic. And so let's, let's, I want to point that out here because we're talking about very clear decisions of councils and very clear decisions and, and writings of the saints who consider the, the baptisms of, of heretics to be uh, actually pollutions, as we've said in a previous uh, lectures we've had. And they do not avail at all to the washing away of sins. This is the sad reality of heresy that St. Basil the Great says. We, we reject out of hand any heretical uh, ba baptism by heretics. He says it in his first canon. He goes on, we receive those who come over to the Orthodox faith who are baptized without being baptized as being unbaptized. And without danger, without danger, we baptize them. Some people will say, well, this, this, this would be a blasphemy. So those who claim this is blasphemy to baptize supposedly a second time, they're saying, no, it's not a second time. It's only once. The one is the churches. The one is irrepe irrepeatable. The one that's irrepeatable is the churches, which is the only baptism, literally the only baptism, because baptism means immersion, uh, but also uh, only baptism which has uh, the Orthodox faith is a presupposition, of course, and it's connected to the whole, uh, all the mysteries. It's in the one church, and it's confessed in the one faith. Uh, in accordance with the apostolic and synodal canons, upon which Christ's holy and apostolic and Catholic church, the common mother of us all, firmly relies. So without danger, we baptize them in accordance with the apostolic and synodal canons. Together with this joint resolve and declaration of ours, we seal this, our ordos, being as it is in agreement with apostolic and synodal dictates, and we certify it by our signature, and then we have the signatures of the three uh, um, Eastern patriarchs at the time. Antioch did not was not present, and the Slavs were not present. But this is an important decision, a very important decision, which will which will uh, receive a lot of attention and a lot of uh, uh, a, lot, a lot of controversy, but also uh, be embraced by our our saints tonight. And uh, now the behind this, I, we don't have time to go into it, but it's important. And maybe I'll go into it later on when I do the uh, supplementary, supplementary uh, session dealing with uh, the correspondence between the Colivales fathers and Dorotheos Volismas. Uh, there's also the, the important figure of Evstratios Argenti, who is really the, the, probably the theologian. His tract, his piece that he had written, I think was used or it was influential on the decision in 1755. And there's a masterful uh, examination in the 1960s by Metropolitan Calestus Ware uh, of, of uh, that, that piece and, the, and, and that teaching. Uh, so let's now go on. That that's, gives you a little bit of historical background, what's going on at the time, um, what's been decided on the part of the patriarchs. Of course, there's been a lot of pushback as well because of the political implications and maybe even other implications that this would be, that this would mean for. Orthodox under the Venetians or whatever the various Latin-minded uh, uh, rulers that had that were uh, in different parts of the Mediterranean. So there's there's implications politically and pastorally to that decision. I think that's part of why there was some pushback. Uh, but there's no there's not 
to my knowledge, there's not a serious theological objection coming from that time period uh, that's been penned and 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 stayed the test of time. Those who were writing throughout the second half of the 18th century, including those of the Patriarchate, such as Dorothea Vulismas, who was a well, uh, who the Patriarchate had to do uh, doing a lot of work throughout the uh, the, the uh, local churches in Romania, the Slavic churches, the, and throughout Greece, he was a well-traveled and extremely well-educated man. He, for instance, was a friend of the Kolivanis, supporter of the Kolivanis, and certainly did not agree on anything uh, of substance with the Kolivanis' father. So where is the pushback theologically, spiritually? You don't see that. Politically, sure. Uh, but did they produce anything of note? No. Not that I know of, and I'm happy to be corrected if there is something. So let's go back now to what we're going to look at tonight is the, uh, the Kolivanis fathers, mainly mainly St. Athanasius Parios, St. Nicodemus of the Holy Mountain, uh, Neophytos, and also another thinker which we didn't mention, Ikonomos, e, e, um, uh, who is, um, uh, well, for those of you on Patreon, we've sent out descriptions of, of all the, the major players. You can find it also in I Confess One Baptism. But he's a, an influential, uh, Constantine Economos of the Economy. He's an influential cleric, teacher, uh, who is going to weigh in uh, in the spirit and in the, in, the, in the tradition of the Holy Father, uh, Holy Fathers. And <clears throat> Father George Matinos uses him in his examination as well. So we'll be citing him as well. Now this is the Canon Seven. We've seen this already in our in our lesson, but let's go back quickly and read it. It's a very important Canon. It's basically repeated in Trullo and Benthecti. Uh, so this is the core Canon, which deals with the question. And as it turns out, and, we're, and it's examined in Father George's uh, text by Neophytos of Kafsuqualivia. So it turns out this Canon was not a Canon of the Second Ecumenical Council. There, it's very. Uh, it's been proved historically that this was a uh, the practice of the Patriarchate of Constantinople, and it was incorporated later on in the canons of the Second Ecumenical Council. And if it had not been received in Trullo, there would be grounds probably to question its legitimacy. And the author does, does question its. its it's, it's not legitimacy per se because it was received in Trullo by the fathers, but it's, it's uh, importance and it's, uh, uh, it's relevance. So in the second, in the second, in the uh, fourth century, uh, even though it says it's the seventh, it's the seventh canon of the, of the second American council, it was not in those canons. It was not a part of that decision. It was added about 40, 50, 60 years, 40 years later. It's hard to say exactly but definitely about the time of Nestorios or after that, uh, this was, uh, this surfaces historically. And we know from a variety of uh, historical witnesses that they had, they were asking for it and, and questioning it, not as the second, not as a canon of the Second Ecumenical Council. So we know historically that it was not. Now, having said that, the, none of our fathers doubt that this canon has uh, has to be dealt with as a universally recognized canon uh, because of Trullo and because of its uh, its incorporation there. Although Trullo incorporated a lot of canons, and one of the questions that we're going to talk about tonight is they seem to be they seem to be contradictory. And for my strictly rational kind of Western approach to the canons and the practice, uh, it's very hard. I don't see how anybody can can come away from this question not seeing things as contradictory. The only way it can be re can be reconciled. Well, we'll see what the saints how they do that. There, how they reconcile these things. So let's read the canon again. As for heretics who convert to orthodoxy and join the portion of the saved, we receive them in accordance with the following procedure and custom: we receive Arians and Macedonians and Sabbatians and Novatians who call themselves Kathari and Aristiri and Tesara Kedekatati, otherwise known as Tetravite and Apollinarist, when they submit written statements, 
anathemize every heresy that does not believe as the Orthodox Holy, Holy Catholic and Apostolic Church of God believes, and are first sealed with miron, chrism, chrismation, on the forehead and the eyes, and the nose and the mouth and the ears. And in sealing them, we say, seal of the gift of the Holy Spirit. Eunomians, on the other hand, who are baptized with one immersion, the Montanists, who in this city are called Phrygians and Sabellians, who teach the Son Fatherhood of Christ, and who do other evil things as well, and all other heresies, for there are many hereabout, especially those hailing from the region of the Galatians, all of them that wish to join Orthodoxy were received as pagans. On the first day, we make them Christians. On the second, catechumens. On the third day, we exercise them. In other words, they read exorcisms over them with a threefold blowing into their face and ears. And then we catechize them. And we oblige them to spend sufficient time in the church and to listen to the scriptures. And then we baptize them. All right, so that's the canon. And we're going to come back to this and talk about it. Uh, but that's the basic canon. Now, going into the interpretation our Holy Fathers have some basic ecclesiological and canonical presuppositions that we have to take into consideration to understand their interpretation. And, of course, these are uh, canonical and ecclesiological presuppositions we all have to consider, and the Church has always considered. So the basic center is going to be the Ephesians 4-5 of Saint, the Holy Apostle Paul, where he says clearly, there is one Lord, one faith, and one baptism. And thus, the Holy Fathers teach there's one church, which is Orthodox, and outside of which baptism does not exist. This is the starting point. <clears throat> this unity of the mysteries with the mystery of the church. Basic, basic, which unfortunately is not understood in this question today. Along with the entire church, especially in the East, they followed the early church's ecclesiology that we've been talking about and presenting, formulated by St. Ignatius, St. Cyprian especially, who gave it a uh, much form, uh, Fermilion, his uh, contemporary and predecessor to St. Basil, St. Basil himself, and uh, Cyril of Jerusalem, and many others. The second basic uh, presupposition here is the apostolic canons. We'll, we'll, we'll talk about what those are in a minute. <clears throat> the baptism, number three, the baptism is one, and it is only of the church, and consists of three immersions, type of or form being inseparable from the spirit and reality. So that's a basic presupposition. Baptism of heretics is, following Basil's 47th canon and St. Cyprian's teachings, entirely without substance, pseudo-baptism. Being outside the church, unsound in faith, without priesthood, their baptism, even if done properly, is not true, is not effective. All right? That is one of the presuppositions, one of the basic uh, physiological givens that they're going to bring to the whole question of examining the economy and the application uh, of the of economy. Baptism is homologos, homologos to the dogmas, and triune immersion is itself also a dogma. So, talk about baptism as the as the form, the type, the immersion part. Uh, it's inseparable from the dogma, the teaching on baptism. So it's as if it's also a dogma. It's a part of the dogma. It's, a, it's, a, it's considered dog, a dogmatic point, which is, in it, which is non-negotiable. Thus, altering the God-given form without urgent necessity is an uncondonable breach of apostolic tradition, an abominable act. So without an absolute urgent necessity, some kind of emergency baptism, which is not what we're talking about at all, it's an uncondonable breach of apostolic tradition. <clears throat> St. Basil teaches, faith and baptism are two modes that are mutually inherent and undivided. For faith is perfected through baptism, while baptism is founded through faith. They cite this, I think it's Economos cites this uh, teaching of St. Basil, and it's so basic and so important, all right? They are, baptism is founded through faith, and faith is perfected through baptism. So these two things are inseparable. You don't have the Orthodox faith. You don't have the triune immersion. You don't have baptism. No matter what you do, you don't have baptism, according to the Holy Fathers here. Number seven, one of the, most, one of the more important, this is why I singled it out, 
<clears throat> the triune immune the triune triune should be uh immersion is requisite for the foundation of the mystery the sacrament uh and it befits its dogmatic natures in other words by the triune immersion we confess the dogma of the divinely sovereign trinity pronounced in the invocations right the triune immersion is a confession of the dogma of the trinity pronounced in the invocation it's not secondary or unimportant and not only this but also the dogma of the dispensation of christ our god and savior inasmuch as the three immersions and the immersions symbolically typify his death and burial and his resurrection on the third day so it's also pertaining to the economy of our lord and his three day uh, burial his death and resurrection uh from the tomb so it's referring to both and it's inseparable from the mystery according to saint nicodemus it is not a matter of mere symbolism but of reality for the person affects the lord's death in himself we really do die spiritually to the old man that is the person who is baptized dies and is buried with christ in the baptismal water without three the three immersions it is impossible for there to be in us the likeness of christ's death and three-day burial this is saint nicodemus of the holy mountain author of 100 works including the greatest works of spiritual life in the in the church philogalia ever get to know so remember that this is not a legalist it's not a westernized legalist talking this is our father who gave us some of the greatest works of the spiritual life and the ethos of the church christoethia and all the rest um he goes on yet the orthodox baptism at the same time typifies the descent into hades of the lord's soul hence through the typification of christ's burial the body of the baptized person is fashioned by god whereas through the typification of the descent of hades his soul is deified so this is not something you play with this is an integral to the whole mystery into the theology of the church so again you cannot talk like aquinas talked which he said oh well baptism doesn't mean immersion baptism means washing so if you wash in whatever way sprinkling pouring or immersion it's the same thing that is an aquinas scholastic western idea nowhere present in the holy fathers rejected out of hand by the holy fathers as legitimate and acceptable and a and a faithful keeping of the holy tradition so very important point here i can't stress it enough let's look at the apostolic canons that they really uh relied on and why that's good because they're under attack over the last hundred years as being not authentically by the actual apostles which was believed to be the case for of course until recently for generations and let's talk about that a second before we get into the canons is that is that the death nail of the canons does that mean well these canons are no longer important because they're not actually if that's the case which is that scholarly opinions today uh through a variety of uh, uh texts that they found from the time periods <clears throat> they believe that it's not actually written by the apostles and my question is does that matter in other words these canons are called apostolic canons also because they are been handed down from the time and the times after the holy fathers and of the uh, the holy apostles in other words they are in the spirit and in the tradition of the holy apostles whether they actually wrote them is rather secondary what's important is that they are coming down from us and passed on from us and inspired by those disciples of the disciples and they were accepted by the church right so we have canon seven we just saw was actually not of the second mechanical council but the church accepted it in trullo and nobody doubts it but then they turn around and they seem to doubt the apostolic canons which was also accepted in trullo why the double standard because these canons are very clear absolute in their teaching about non about heterodox heterodox heter heretical baptisms and mysteries and there's no way of getting around that see so this becomes something we've got to 
we've got to deal with this. How are we going to deal with these cannons, which are, you know, as it were, sitting on our neck uh, and not not very pleasant for us who want to be ecumenists in our day and age. So let's read this, these important canons, especially 46, but all of them are, are, are pertinent. We order that a bishop or presbyter that recognize the baptism or sacrifice of heretics be defrocked. For what accord has Christ with Belial? Or what has a believer in common with an unbeliever? Okay, so the presbyter or bishop who recognizes the mystery of baptism of the heretics needs to be defrocked. Are there a few of those today? You bet there are. Are they in the highest positions of the church? Yes, they are, including patriarchs including patriarchs, recognizing Latin baptism as the one baptism. So we have a total apostasy, not only from the Holy Fathers, Fathers, but from the apostolic canons here uh, in our day and age. Canon 47. If a bishop or presbyter baptize anew anyone that has had a true baptism or fail to baptize someone that has been polluted by the impious, let him be defrocked. So you fail to baptize those who've been baptized among the heterodox? That, that's what that means, polluted by the impious. You fail to baptize them, you should be defrocked, according to this canon. How does this reconcile? We're going to see. The fathers themselves struggle with how to reconcile this with canon 7. We just read, which says particular heretics will be received by chrismation. There's various answers to that. We'll see what, what they say. If a bishop or presbyter conduct an initiation of baptism and perform not three immersions, but one immersion, sound familiar? That, that's what the that's why Patriarch uh, of Constantinople at the time of the schism was baptizing the Latins who were coming to them. Why? Because they had accepted in the West the idea that one immersion is acceptable. But here we see that if anyone does one immersion and not three, they should be defrocked. He says, the minister into the Lord's death, let him be defrocked. That's the same language used in Canon 7 with the rejection of the Eunomian baptism. The same idea. They were baptizing into the death of, uh, of, the, of, the, uh, of the, those they were baptized. In other words, it's not, a, it's not sufficient. you got to die and rise. There's a threefold immersion. So there's a reason for everything. Uh, he goes on, for the Lord did not say immerse, the Greek word baptizing. All right, so that's what that that's what baptism means to immerse into my death. He did not say immerse into my death. He said, "Go and make all the nations disciples, immersing them, baptizing them, in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit." So, whenever you think of baptism, you must, if you're going to understand it properly, think of immersion because that's what the word means in Greek. It means to plunge into to plunge to to immerse into water. Uh, or something. Uh, so he commanded us to immerse. He didn't command us to he didn't command us to wash people, but to immerse them that they would die in the old man would die and rise new uh, spiritually. We look. We heard what Saint Nicodemus was how he explained that spiritually. Why that's in integral to the to the uh, the mystery. Uh, if a bishop or a presbyter or deacon accept a second ordination from anyone, let him and who and he who ordained him be defrocked, unless it is established that he had been ordained by heretics. For those who are baptized or ordained by such cannot possibly be either believers or clerics. So here they reject the ordination of heretics out of hand in, can, in Canon 68 of the Holy uh, Father. So, Again, I put this here so we can remember, remind ourselves of those canons and this canon, and how in this canon we have a ceiling of certain heretics without baptism. Others are baptized. All others are baptized eventually in the canon 95. So this is a very particular group that is being received by Grismation. It includes some of the worst heretics of the ancient church that it denied the divinity of Christ and the divinity of the Holy Spirit. So those who say, oh, it, it, if you're close, we chrismate. If you're far away, we baptize. Here is Canon 7, clearly not saying that. Arians are being chrismated. So what's going on here? 
Let's hear what the whole, why are the Kolivadi so important? Because they have grappled with and come to a consensus among all those fathers at the time as to how to reconcile these apparent contradictions of the canons. And it goes without saying that the Holy Spirit doesn't contradict himself. So it's not an option to say they contradict themselves and we'll just live with it because that's not how the church works. And these canons have been accepted and embraced within councils that have been accepted as ecumenical. And the church believes the ecumenical councils are the voice of the church and the voice of the Holy Spirit. So it, it's, it's, it's not possible to walk away with such an, such a, uh, uh, relativization of the canons, which is which is very dangerous, and in fact, we see that happening in our own day, don't we? So let's solve the problem of the apparent contradictions. Stick with me, be patient, come back and visit it if you can't get it all in the first time. But it's going to be a uh, going to go deep here. Question: Why did the Second Ecumenical Council not reject the baptism? And by the way, if you want a full treatment, you've got to go and get the book or find it online. It's not actually online for free. Uh, you probably won't be able to find a hard copy anywhere, but um, he gives the full treatment, and, and I did not, obviously, and I cannot rep reproduce the book here. So we're going to take and leave some things as well. The historical examination of, of the practice of the church, I've left out entirely because there's not enough time. Why did the Second Ecumenical Council not reject the baptism of all heretics in accordance with the apostolic canons and the council presided over by St. Cyprian? And all the rest of the great and God-bearing fathers, like we said, St. Basil, who rejects them, but accepted the baptism of some heretics while not, while, while not that of others. So that's a basic question here we want answered. The classification of heretics into those who are in need of baptism and those who are not is the core of the problem created by this canon. The problem becomes even more acute for the Second Ecumenical Council appeared tolerant and accommodating towards the more impious, more impious among the heretics of that time, namely the Arians and Macedonians, who rejected the divinity of Christ and blasphemed against the Holy Spirit. So obviously if you're rejecting the divinity of Christ and you're blaspheming against the Holy Spirit, you're not in the grace of God. I mean, can anybody doubt that? Does anybody have any problem with that, uh, saying that? Uh, you're not... You're not going to be baptized into Christ if you're against his divinity. And you're not going to be baptized by the Holy Spirit if you don't, if you're blaspheming the Holy Spirit. So what the church is not recognizing the mysteries of the Arians, right? Or the Macedonians. It's not what the church can, it's impossible for the church to do that. That would be insane. That would be basically saying you don't have to have faith in Christ and the Holy Spirit to be in Christ and the Holy Spirit. I think we can all agree on that. So something else is going on here. What is going on? So at first sight, there seems to be a disagreement between the Holy Canons, uh, the Holy Councils, and the Patristic Canons. For two ecumenical councils, the second by its Canon uh, 7 and Penthecti by its Canon 95, come into conflict not only with the above-mentioned fathers, but also with the apostolic canons, which Penthecti, same council, uh, and thus the, the whole church, ratified notwithstanding, and which, according to St. Nicodemus, command the opposite. So you have, you have one council accepting the canons that command one thing, which is do not accept any heretical baptism. You have the apostolic canons, you have St. Basil, you have St. Cyprian. Okay, do not accept any, they're all accepted in Pentecti. Do not accept any heretical baptism whatsoever. They're, it's impious. And then you have Canon 7, which says, oh, no, these heretics will not be baptized. What's going on? Well, there's different. There's different answers. Let's hear some answers. The position of the Second Ecumenical Council towards the Arians and Macedonians can be explained according to St. Nicodemus if we take into consideration that the church has two modes of governing and correcting, namely the acrivia, precision, exactitude is what most people translate it as, actually. Uh, I don't think rigorism is a ter good term at all. I don't think that's what's going on. Uh, I'm just quoting here from the translation and economia which they have here as concession or dispensation again i don't think these are the best terms uh, i probably should just got rid of them but it's good to discuss these you, you're, you're running into them as well uh, economia is management of the house of the of the church it's the 
uh, it's the uh, econo economy of salvation we're being worked out the very economy that the lord brought to the earth is now being worked out by the lord by the way not by men but by the lord himself through the holy councils and the holy fathers he's working out the economy of salvation the process the plan of salvation in each person and in each instance so it's not a concession it's not a dispensation really it's blessed it's god's will it's a blessed thing it's not some bad discount version of christianity all right and neither is it neither is it something that um uh is contrary to a krivia. it cannot overcome a krivia or exactitude so Continuing, whereas the apostles and earlier councils and fathers applied acrivia, exactitude, to ecumenical councils accepted economia. So this alteration of acrivia, alternation of acrivia and economia under certain defined conditions removes any hint of contradiction among the holy canons and the councils. According to this, this saint, Saint Nicodemus, the Second Ecumenical Council kept the canon partially, acting in accordance with the economia and concession, as they translate it, economia being a fruit of the church's pastoral and remedial ministry. It was exercised for provisional historical reasons. One of the things we have to remember in your note taking, write down economy, economy can never be a precedent. It is never acts as a precedent, legally or canonically. It's an exception, and it's always case by case. So there are many today who run to church history and look at economic solutions in church history in Russia or in Constantinople or wherever it might be, and call upon that as precedent for what we're doing today, and that is fundamentally erroneous. Every situation is a prevent it's, it, when economy is applied for whatever reason it is. And remember, Saint Basil said, "Economias enekontopolon," economy on the account of the many. So it was clearly a particular historical context and situation that he says, because we have many coming groups, massive groups, possibly because some were baptized, some were not within the church. You know, these were recent heresies. Hard to know exactly, but that's one theory put down by the saints, that the reason why there was economy on many of these groups is because some of these people had been baptized as Orthodox and had only gone over to them recently. But to figure that out when there's hundreds or thousands coming back is impossible, so there was economy because they would not want to repeat, obviously, the baptism, the Orthodox baptism twice. So there's never precedent. And, and, the, the given is the ecclesiological statements about mysteries. That is given throughout all church history. And the exception is, according to time and place and purpose, fulfilling the presuppositions always, uh, the economy. That's the exception, and it's not a precedent. Again, now, the heretics in question were many in number and politically strong. Hence, the Synodal Fathers showed leniency in order to attract them to Orthodoxy and to correct them more easily. And so it might, it might not happen that they further infuriate them against the Church and the Christians, and the evil thus become worse. So St. Nicodemus is saying, look, there's, there were very good reasons, pastoral reasons, that if the Church did what they did, otherwise they would have lost so many souls to the Church. They would have rebelled, they would have been fighting, they would have been perhaps even martyrdom, who knows what would have been the consequences. Uh, so they, they exercise this economy. The exercise of economy, therefore, was not arbitrary. It's not arbitrary. Oh, um, uh, you want to be baptized? This is what we have today. People want to be baptized. And priests are saying, no, no, you can't be baptized. Why? What On what basis would you turn somebody away who wants to be baptized? There's nothing here that can be appealed to to say that you must not be baptized unless you've adopted a foreign ecclesiology. Uh, that's what's going on today. That's largely what's going on today. There might be some exceptions. So the exercise was not arbitrary. It was justified. Having in view the salvation of the heretics and the peace of the church. 
And we're going to get further into economy because I know some of you are saying, well, can you really do that? Can somebody be saved by economy in this way? Can they really be grafted onto the church without being baptized within the church? It seems very clear in the apostolic canons that there's no exceptions here. Okay, we'll get there. Hang on. Answer number two, uh, part two of the, of the same answer, solving these problems of apparent contradictions. The Second Ecumenical Council's classification of heretics into those in need of baptism and those in need of chrismation, however, was based, according to our writers, on a specific ecclesiological and canonical assumption. Heretics who were required to be baptized had, according to the equal nomos, as a common characteristic, not only the utter blasphemy regarding the divine dogmas, but most, mostly the impious transgression as regards to the kind of baptism they had. All right, so he's saying that the canonical and ecclesiological assumptions being made here, not, not explicitly stated in the canon, is that besides the blasphemy that the Arians and Macedonians and all the heretics had, right, they're heretics because they, were, they had fallen away from the faith, right? So all of them were, were in this category. Besides that, there, were, there was the question of transgressing regarding the type or form of baptism. That created the this, this differentiation in reception. This transgression was twofold regarding the invocation of the persons of the Holy Trinity. There were cases like that with the Montanists. And regarding the trying immersion of the person baptized as such with the Eunomians. So Nicodemo says, those belonging to this group, Eunomians, Montanists, Sabellians, and all other heresies, okay, so if anybody asks, well, today, what do, what do we do? Well, we're in the category of all other heresies. We're not in the category of the particular heresies of the day. We're without any possible exception received as pagans, as wholly unbaptized. For either they had never been baptized, or else they've been baptized, but not correctly in the manner the Orthodox are baptized. So again, I'm going to come back, and we're going to be repetitive, because it's really important to come back. I said this earlier in class. In lessons, and that is that when we talk about validity, which is not really talked about here, you don't hear that term, although it's, it can be used. This is not, it's not really a patristic term in my experience anyway. You don't, it's a Western kind of legalistic term. But anyway, we talk about validity, which can be basically understood as uh, correctness, you know, in terms of the, of the mystery. But he, it's always referring to, when we're talking about heretical baptism, it's always referring to the form. So I was referring, referring, referring to the main maintenance of the holy tradition as it pertains to the how a baptism is carried out. The, 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 it's done in an orthodox manner. But it's, we're talking about the externals here. All right? Validity is not referring to a real baptism, spiritually uh, pregnant baptism of, with the Holy Spirit of God, because as we saw, our presuppositions would never allow that, would they? Because we have one baptism, one Lord, one faith, and all the rest. And that ecclesiology is a given, and, it, and it's been a given, and, and it's been said to be a given by scholars who don't like it much. I mean, apparently, Bishop Carlos Square doesn't like that much, but he, he admitted that that's the given. That's the reality of the church's history. Uh, and, and Florovsky and others have said the same thing. No one doubts that, unless you're extremely ignorant of what's going on in the church. Uh, so that that is the backdrop, and so... Validity is referring only, can only refer to the externals. It can never refer to the actual baptism being present outside the church. Mysteries do not exist outside the one mystery, which is the church. Part three, the exercise of economia towards the Arians and Macedonians does not at all mean that the council overlooked the faith, but that the degree of their deviation from the Orthodox faith was not of primary importance. Very important point. All right. People say all the time, again, oh, you if the heretic or the, the, the person who's falling away from the church is only a heretic in, in a little bit, that's why we receive them by confession of faith or by chrismation or something. But if they're really, you know, all kinds of crazy ideas, well, then that they have to be baptized. No, it doesn't follow at all from this canon or from the Holy Fathers. It's not based primarily on the deviation from the faith. Right, it's very it's very clear here because it doesn't follow. I mean, if you read the, the canon, it doesn't follow. That's their reasoning because we have Arians being received by chrismation, 
and you have lesser heretics uh, that are received by by baptism, and they, and they give the reason Im implicitly give the reason that is because of the form has been distorted. Economia was possible because these heretics had preserved the apostolic tradition in their own baptism, for they baptized according to the Lord's command in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and with three immersions and immersions. So that's why economia was possible. To cut to the chase, we're going to get there later, but since we, we just stated this, think about today. Is economia possible? Or is it not? This is what the Holy Fathers of the Holy Fathers, Fathers are teaching us. And if we're going to be their disciples, have their blessing, we need to follow their teachings. Not an academic theologian, not a priest from Greece who just appears on your screen. It's not important what I say. It's not important what any academic theologian says. It's important what the saints say and the consensus of the saints. All right. So we have the whole choir of the Holy Fathers, Fathers of one mind on these basic teachings. Ecclesiology is not up for debate at all. And so economia was possible because they preserved the apostolic tradition. They immersed and they said they, they spoke the names. Then having that form, the fathers say, now we're not going to undermine ecclesia. We're not going to undermine the dogma. We're not going to undermine ecclesiology if we economize. Without these things, we will. And I think history has proven them right. 200 years later, where are we? With regard to the question of Orthodox priest baptizing in the apostolic manner all around the Orthodox Church. It's increased in the 20th, 20th, 20th century, 21st century. Apparently, it's increased more and more. There's a laxity. There's a fear. There's a worldliness. There's a, a papal uh, Latin approach to things. You, you see hierarchs and priests baptizing like the Latins. How did that happen? precisely because they didn't follow these principles laid down, these ecclesiological principles laid down by the Kodi Bodies Fathers, and also apparent in the decision of the 1756 Three, higher, uh, three Patriarchs decision. Uh, St. Nicodemus says, the economia that some fathers temporarily use can either be thought of as a law or taken as an example. We said this earlier, bears repeating, there's no precedent set. For economia, who invokes the Holy Fathers, has its limits, economos. Economia is permissible as long as it involves no violation of the law. As St. John Chrysostom uh, says proverbially. So, economia does not undermine ecclesia. Economia does not undermine the law, the, the given, the basics, right? It does not undermine ecclesiology. But we see that happening all the time today. We have a whole different ecclesiology being adopted here by, by certain members of the church, that they're already baptized and you will blaspheme. This is what we hear. Now, you might find a Western father say something similar. It matters little because we don't go from one or two fathers, but the consensus of the fathers. And these fathers are basing themselves on the ecclesiology set down from the earliest times all the way up to their time. And it's a consistent teaching, uh, and it's not up, up to debate. Now, let me give you a summary by Father George Metallinos about these key principles of interpretation, uh, which is the most important part of the book. It goes on and talk about application in terms of the Latins. We'll talk about that as well. But really, you've got to understand the interpretation, the principles, the, the keys to understanding our practice and the Crivia Economia if you want to make sense of what's going on in the church today. By the principle of economia, there's no discord among the church's holy canons, which is the, which in this seemingly curious antinomy retain their unity and preserve the freedom in Christ. All right, so that's something that you've got to crucify your mind on because guess what? We're all rationalists today. We're coming lo super logical. We want to, everything to you know be very scientifically you know uh, numbered properly and all the rest. But here it is, there's an antinomy, and it retains the unity within the whole question of grieve and economia. And you've got to crucify your mind on that and understand that Christ is above his commandments. Christ is the head of the church. The same Christ who let the thief on the cross into heaven is, is, is carrying out true and proper uses of economia, not abuses, 
but true and proper use of the Konamiya throughout church history. Number two, the second ecumenical council in exercising the Konamiya towards certain specifically named heretics, specifically named heretics, did not leave the ground open for the inclusion of this in this category of any other heretics unchecked. Konamiya was used for important historical and pastoral reasons without revoking the Akrivia ratified by the second part of the canon and exercised on other heretics, again, not arbitrarily, all right? So it's not arbitrary. Uh, there's principles and there's reasons why the economy is involved and, the, and we've got to follow those if we're going to have the blessing of, you know, truly economia, meaning carrying out of salvation for those people who've been received in whatever way is not the, the Akrivia. All right, again, number, uh, continuing in his summary, last part, the exercise of economia was possible because there existed the absolute necessary formal conditions. The correct execution of the sacrament by these heretics with three immersions and immersions. The rejection of the single immersion and baptism of the Eunomians, who were classified among the holy unbaptized, indicates the councils and consequently the Catholic Church's condemnation of any alteration in the form of the sac sacrament of baptism, which alteration is sufficient to render the exercise of economia towards these heresies, heretics entirely impossible. All right, very important point here. The rejection of the three versions makes it impossible for them to do economy. And that's true today. If you're not immersing three times, if you're just pouring or sprinkling or immersing once, economia is not applicable, should not be applied. It's an abuse of economia to apply it and receive people into the church who are not fulfilling that presupposition. That the, and and this and unfortunately, or just the way that the, the, the heterodox have have devolved, very few heterodox baptized as the Orthodox baptized, as the, as the saints have taught us to baptize. So we're talking about just a minuscule amount, and, and so the vast majority of heterodox do not baptize properly. In this case, according to Economos, the danger concerning all, they were not born of water in the spirit, nor were they through baptism buried with Christ into his death. So they took this very seriously. That symbolism is reality, St. Nicodemus says. You don't pass through that, you don't have the reality. You do, you have the form, the church can economize. You don't have the form, the church cannot economize. So it's a very important thing. You can't just say, well, wave the wand and say, economy, all things are, are good. That's not how economy is. It has its presuppositions. It has its guide. So the problem in the final analysis is not uh, the disregard or rejection of a mere form. All right, some people say, oh, you guys are, Formalist, you're 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 externalist. You're no, this is not what's going on here. The form is not alone. It points to something. Points to the faith, uh, but something much deeper, namely disobedience to Christ's commandments and unfaithfulness to church tradition. And this tradition, if not held fast in its totality as pleroma, fullness of life, runs the risk of becoming estranged and consequently of losing its local force. Brothers and sisters, we are living that estrangement, and it's not an accident. It has to do with our stance, our lack of not following the Holy Fathers, our lack of following the Holy Fathers to say that these very errors of the, of the heterodox have crept into the orthodox. So what this point is making here, the point they're making here is that we cannot allow for any discount in the Holy Tradition. Otherwise, we will become estranged ourselves and lose uh, the, the, the blessings of, of the mysteries. Application of the canon to the present day. Now this is gonna be somewhat piecemeal because it's quite more, much more extensive in the book, but we'll do our best. The status of the papal and reformed Protestants. That's, our, that's the question we have before us. Are they schismatics or heretics? St. Nicodemus says, they are as the ancient heretics, like Arians or Sabellians or Pnevmatomachi Macedonians, 
He cites St. Mark of Ephesus, Patriarch Dositheos and Elias Meniatis, famous uh, uh, teacher in the 17th century, 18th century, uh, among others. Even if there is only one error with respect to the faith, the filioque, and all of the other issues are non-dogmatic, it is sufficient to be considered a heretic, right? So iconoclast had one heresy. They didn't have five. You don't need to have five heresies to become a heretic. One is enough. Uh, councils condemn the Latins by way of the filioque, and so they are considered heretics. Uh, and as we saw in this Eighth Ecumenical Council, as we saw in our previous uh, uh, look at St. Mark of Ephesus and St. Gregory Palamas, that's the patristic position. And St. Mark says we cut them off because they're heretics, not because they're confused. There's, there's, it's very important to establish that because then our position with, with regard to them is going to be a particular position following the holy tradition. It's not going to be up for debate. The Eighth Ecumenical Council presided over Photius, right? That's now we're giving the councils that condemned uh, the filioque and therefore the Latins that themselves were present at the Eighth Ecumenical Council, as we saw, and they condemned themselves, the filioque, but then they turned on their own fathers, their own tradition, their own teachings. They eventually got rid of the Eighth Ecumenical Council and, and uh, chose the uh, previous council, which was an anti Photian council. So they have turned away from the Eighth Ecumenical Council. The council at which Michael Ser Ularios presided, 1054, the council presided over by Gregory II of Constantinople, which cut off the Latins from the plenum of the Orthodox and disinherited them from God's church, quote unquote. The council of Sergius II of Constantinople, the one, that is the time of, in uh, 1014 when it decided to delete the name of Sergius the Pope of Rome, the Dictics, because he had a he had adopted the filioque. The councils during the reigns of emperors Alexios, John, and Manuel Comnini in the 11th to 12th century. We have, of course, the False Council of Lyon, the False Council of Florence, the Council of the Three Patriarchs in the East after the Council of Florence, and the local councils in Russia, Moldova, and, and the rest. So we have quite a lot of material to decide, well, what is the status of the Reformed, uh, the Papal and the Reformed Protestants, because the Reformed Protestants, of course, didn't exist in the uh, first 500 years uh, after the schism, but they come from papal Protestantism. Uh, so are they schismatic? Again, going on. On the basis of the above ecclesiological presuppositions, the Latins as heretics are not capable of administering baptism. For they lost the grace to administer sacraments, as St. Nicodemus observes. They have no baptism, quoted in Neophytos, for they lack the sound confession of the Trinity. Thus their baptism deviates from the faith, according to St. Basil, since by introducing pagan polyarchy into the monarchic Trinity, the Latins are godless and consequently unbaptized, unquote. However, they are also unbaptized in the literal sense, according to St. Nicodemus, for they do not preserve the three immersions, and thus do not have the church's baptism. Neophytos observes that since they are no wise immersed, baptized, they are unbaptized. It's very simple. St. Athanasius Parios reiterates the same. So all the Kolivani's fathers here who are dealing with this issue, the Athenite Kolivani's fathers, are in agreement. There's no, so some people want to say St. Nicodemus wasn't in agreement with this position, that he, he was debating and, and arguing over it with with uh, Dorotheos Vulismas. Well, that's just not the case at all. And in the future uh, future podcasts, we're gonna go very much into that and, and show that that's, the, that's not the case. Uh, but you can see right here, they're, they're of one mind. Now, given that the Latins are now heretics, can the Second Ecumenical Council's provisional distinction concerning Arians and Macedonians also be applied to them? In other words, that's been, that's been the case in, in previous times. Even St. Mark of Ephesus, I think, said, uh, well, they're like the ancient heretics, and we've seen that. But what's going on now in the 17th and 18th centuries? Is it, is it the same that was going on in the 15th century? Uh, is the status, is the, is, is the economy uh, possible to be reenacted again? Remember, economy is not a precedent, so it's got to be looked at again and again for each, each case. To see if it's possible, and they're asked. They're asking the question: Can we can we do that again in this case? 
And so by economy, can they be received by chrismation alone without being baptized? That's the question. Now let's get the answer from the Holy Fathers. That the West maintained that their baptism in no way differed from the apostolic baptism. Economos, however, responds that effusion, pouring, and much less aspersion, sprinkling, cannot ever be considered baptism. Again, the West had no problem with that from the from at least the time of Aquinas. They never considered there be any difference between pouring, <coughs> sprinkling, or immersion. That's not the Orthodox teaching, never has been. So when you hear people say, no, no, it doesn't matter, the pouring, that's not the Orthodox teaching, brothers and sisters. We never taught that. We're being infected by Latin teaching here. Uh, the Orthodox have insisted on immersion always. Now, you, people say, well, the Didache, the Didache, what about the Didache? The Didache is talking about ex emergency, extreme uh, cases, just like an emergency baptism, somebody's about to die, a baby's about to die. That's not a precedent. That's not the teaching here. That's, that's an exception. That's the, an economia, a particular economia. So you can't talk about it as a norm, which is what they're doing. That's a different, totally different reality, to totally different case. The Latins are saying this is the norm. This is the way baptism is. They're, just, they're defining it and understanding the, the form of it in a totally different way from the Orthodox norm. All right. So there, let's not get confused and call upon exceptions of exceptions, which are for emergency situations as precedent for us to not not uh, follow the Holy Fathers in in uh, all uh, exactitude. Uh, first, the first is an uncanonical innovation, while the second is unscriptural and void of the character of the proper and true baptism. So pouring is an uncanonical innovation. Why? Because it's only for those rare, rare exceptions of emergency baptisms and all the rest. It's not the norm. It's not intention. It's no, there's no time when we intentionally do that and think that this is, this is uh, without any extreme need. We don't do that. So it's an uncanonical innovation. The second is unscriptural. There's no scriptural basis for sprinkling, even if they want to imagine that St. Peter and the apostles couldn't baptize 3,000 unless they sprinkled them. That's just an imagination of, of Aquinas and, and, and others that uh, has no scriptural basis or no patristic basis whatsoever. Of course, Economos is not referring here to cases of emergency baptism, as we said, right? which he, even he does not rule out. These, however, are performed within the church in contrast to those who have received the baptism, quote-unquote, of which ever heresy, and do thus receive death instead of life. What he has in mind here is what is done without urgent necessity, being a practice arbitrarily sanctioned in the West, all right? So there's an arbitrariness that's going on in the West. This is not an emergency. This is not urgent necessity. This practice began with Pope Stephen. And was dogmatized at the Council of Trent in accordance with the spirit of the West to canonize and dogmatize every legal uh, and legalize every innovation. But in no way can this innovation be justified, being as it is a practice odious to God, quote unquote, from, from Equinomos, for it destroys the sacraments God ordained oneness. Question Does, Lat does the Latin pouring and sprinkling? contain sanctification and grace by virtue of the invocation of the Holy Trinity. St. Nicodemus, baptism is not consummated by the invocations of the Holy Trinity alone, but also necessarily requires the image of the Lord's death and burial and resurrection. In other words, triune immersion. Belief in the Holy Trinity, even when correct, must be supplemented by the belief in the Messiah's death. And that belief is in practice, not just theoretically. The mere invocation of the Holy Trinity does not sanctify the procedural violation of the sacrament. We need to hear this as Orthodox today because we're woefully inadequate, many of us, in this, in this area. Thus, according to St. Nicodemus, since the Latins are not planted together with Christ, the dual-natured seed in the baptismal water, with Christ, the dual-natured seed in the baptismal water, then neither is their body fashioned by God nor their soul. And simply speaking, they cannot burgeon salvation, but they wither and perish. So he's saying this is a reality. This is not a symbolism. This is something that you, it changes the person. The twofold change going on bodily and spiritually. And the refashioning of, of the old man into the new Adam. Uh, 
This is our theology. If somebody want to, somebody wants to fight this, they're going to have to create a new theology or find us a theology that from another holy father, which says this is not, this is none of this is true, and none of this is, none of this is important, it doesn't exist. And they offer those comments that the Lord ordained birth by water and spirit, but it is not she who sprinkles who gives birth, but she who is pregnant. Talking about the church. In other words, the church, pregnant with grace, is one who gives birth, not the sprinkler. In other words, the one who's fallen away from the fullness of life in Christ and the tradition. Likewise, it is not the sprinkled fetus that is born, but the one who was carried in the womb. So he's using this, this imagery to show you in, in physically how certain things happen, right? In terms of the uh, the the, the birth of a, of a of the body and how it should be the same the, the spiritual birth Economos says the following so the latin aspersion being destitute of the immersions and emergence is consequently also destitute of the image of the lord's three-day death and burial and resurrection and destitute of all grace sanctification and remission of sins question why cannot the same likeness of death also be expressed through effusion or aspersion? This is what Aquinas says. It doesn't matter. It could be aspersion, effusion, could be uh, immersion. All three are good. It's all the same likeness of death is expressed, he says. Let's hear what Economos has to say. He answers, his answer centers around the following four points. The Latin innovation is an intentional violation of the Lord's commandment and the church's tradition. It is contrary to the single and canonical apostolic tradition. It alters the meaning of to baptize. And it is contrary to the apostolic likeness of the death and the burial and the resurrection of Christ as this likeness was interpreted by all the holy divine fathers. So basic points that are not really met by the idea that you can, you can do all three or any, any of the three and still have the likeness of death. The likeness of death is not achieved with aspersion and, the, and, and effusion but rather baptism means to immerse. All right, four important questions now posed by Economos, very important. If there is a demand for the Latin aspersion of fusion to be accepted by economia, then why do not the Latins exercise some economia themselves? And again, resume what from the beginning was delivered to them from the fathers and apostles and abandon their innovations. So many people say, uh, it's on the Orthodox to, to change, the Orthodox to, to put water in their wine and, and dilute things and make things easy. It's on the Orthodox side to uh, go along with the innovations. Well, why can't, why can't the Latins return? What is it? That they can't return to immersion. If they really wanted to be one with the tradition, one with the Orthodox, they would return to what has always been taught. In the church, if he who joins the church, in fact, accepts all the dogmas and sacraments of the Orthodox faith wholeheartedly and genuinely and anathematizes all his patrimonial er erroneous beliefs, how then does he hold as correct the wrongdoing with regard to baptism, which is the foundation of the faith after all? So he's talking to, he's talking to the, the Latins and, and, and the Latinizers who are not willing to, to insist on baptism. And he's saying, well, if they're, they're, they're accepting all the rest, we're talking about people who are coming to the Orthodox faith, right? We're not talking about just per se the, the Latins. We're talking about the, the whole question is those who come to Orthodoxy, how do we receive them? He say, well, if they're accepting everything else, why can't they accept this? Why is this an issue for you Latinizers? It doesn't make any sense. If indeed the church accepts the candidate's written statement in which he anathematizes all his patrimonial erroneous beliefs, how then can she herself accept the innovation with regard to his baptism, it being one of the erroneous beliefs he anathematized? So the church has, 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 the church has stated many, many times from the schism to today that, that their innovations in terms of baptism is one of the, major, one of the many issues that we have with, with the uh, papal Protestants. How is it now that that is no longer, he's talking to the Latinizers, how is it no longer that's an issue that we, we say he needs to reject and yet, he, he, you, you, you are receiving him without doing that. Uh, so, 100 years and more after Economos 
posed these questions, they received the following reply by the Second Vatican Council. Quote, the sacrament of baptism may be performed by immersion or by effusion. This is also in the canon law, by the way. I think in 1917, canon law. Uh, it could be performed by either one. Baptism is immersion. By immersion is the more in indicated form as it signifies the death and resurrection of Christ. So they, they agree. They, they agree that immersion signifies the death and resurrection of Christ. And what do they say? Well, in accordance with our prevailing custom, the sacrament of baptism will generally be performed by effusion, pouring, and not even pouring over the body, just over the head. So they admit that, that, the, that the symbolism and the reality that's communicated with immersion is not communicated with the others, and they don't care, and they don't repent, and they don't say it, they need to return to the earlier tradition. And then we wonder why there's no progress in some kind of reconciliation. Well, there's no progress in such minor, obvious aspects of the holy tradition. Absolutely in the category, they are absolutely in the category of needing to be baptized, according to our holy fathers. The Latins cannot be placed in the category of the Arians and Macedonians for the economy of the Second Economic Council to be, to be also applicable to them. All right, so we've established that now. Because they're, they've, they've put aside, and willfully so, happily so, they've put aside immersion as the, as the way of baptism, and they don't care about that the, there's no symbolism, there's no you know, uh, death and resurrection communicated there. Um, apparently a, a magical thing that happens for them. But we, we actually care. We, need, we want and need it to happen that way for the whole mystery to take part. We don't, we, we're realists in the Orthodox Church. Right? We really believe these things. We really believe that the body of Christ, we really believe you have to die and rise. And that has to be in a physical way, not just a spiritual way. No, it's not possible. It's not necessary. And therefore, there's no room for economy. Neophytos says, they are not at all immersed, but sprinkled or poured in other places. If their aspersion counts as baptism, then it is wholly necessary either to establish two baptisms or having established the one to reject that by triune immersion. So he's saying, look, there's no reconciliation. Economos, the Latins limp on both legs as regard to the correct baptismal rite. In other words, as regards the three immersions and immersions which the sons of Arius and Macedonius generally performed according to the apostolic tradition. So they don't even have what the Arians and the Macedonians performed. St. Athanasius Parios, the Latins are in a worse position than the very Eunomians who at least preserved one immersion. As a consequence, they who convert from the Latins must indisputably, indispensably, and necessarily be baptized. Of course, the baptizing of the Latins does not mean that the dogma, I confess one baptism, is rejected. No, not at all, replies Economos regarding this. When the heretics are administered, are, are administered our rites, in other words, they're baptized when they come to the church, they are not being rebaptized, but baptized. All right? There's only we're talking about sacramental, mysteriological mystery, the mystery of baptism. There's only one, and that is in the church. They're not being rebaptized; they're being baptized. Saint Nicodemus says their baptism belies its name, and therefore the canons baptize those who had received a different baptism contrary to church law, and thus overturn not the one. And only true baptism, but every alien and pseudonymous uh, human invention. Consequently, the baptism of the Latins does not have the meaning of simply making them members of the church, but above all, of accomplishing in them the regeneration that sprinkling is incapable of imparting to them. All right, so we've reached the end of that, and I've, I've summarized. The positions I've left out the section that goes back and ex explains various uh, twists and turns of history in, in in light of the criterion that the fathers are putting forward. Uh, we'll have to ha leave that aside, and you have to look look at it on your own because obviously there's only so much you can cover. We're already at almost two hours, uh, and we're still going to look at Saint uh, Saint uh, uh, Hilarion. Uh, for a future podcast, I want to draw your attention to this. I'm going to answer some critics that have uh, uh, some critics of my book and others 
uh, and this is very important. And this book, uh, which has just come out about two months ago, is a uh, is a collection. Look how thick this is. See that book? See if we can get that. Uh, I don't know. You can't see that, but uh, uh, that is a uh, thousand. 45 pages of correspondence between St. Nicodemus and other Colifadi's fathers and Dorotheos Vulisimas Vulis Vulis about the Pedalian and about particularly, uh, there's a lot going on there, but a lot of it's about the whole question of the Latin baptisms and the interpretation of Canon 7 of the Second Ecumenical Council. And if there's been some scholar in Greece, uh, one of my he was a professor at theological school when I was there, still there, uh, has come forward and put forward piecemeal excerpts from these uh, these uh, letters and given the impression that St. Nicodemus didn't want or didn't agree with the position we just heard, that he was forced into it, essentially. Otherwise, they wouldn't have published the uh, medallion and that he went along with it to get the medallion published. That's what this professor has said, and there couldn't couldn't be further from the truth, unfortunately, for that professor. Uh, and we will show that in a future podcast, quoting profusely from the letters and the uh, and the context uh, and the historical context, and showing that he agreed from the beginning with Dorotheos Vulisimas that he had no problem with the very basic uh, agreed upon Kolivadi stance. Uh, and of course, it doesn't. It, it goes without saying that he is not a opportunist, and he's not going to do an, uh, something bad to have a good thing happen. Right? You can't do a, 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 a good thing in a bad way. And Saint Nicodemus is not going to compromise and go along with things he doesn't believe in to get his pedalion published. That's the implication of the of, of the of the of the excerpts and the presentation made on a number of occasions here in Greece. Now it's coming; it's been translated into English, and it was a part of this critique of my book. And so we're gonna we're gonna, by God's grace, present that, and and you will see just how beautiful and wonderful the cooperation was between these two men and the Holy Holy Body's fathers. How deep uh, and 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 uh, patristic his thinking was, Vulisimas. Uh, how he was a very close uh, friend and supporter and supported by St. Paisius Velitskovsky, who was actually considering going and becoming a monk at the monastery, uh, but he was so uh, needed and valued in Constantinople, he didn't go. But St. Paisius held him in high regard. His own treatise on the question was translated by monks of St. Paisius Monastery and published and circulated. St. Paisius was very supportive of the same position we see tonight, uh, very strict uh, on, on the question of the Uniates who baptize as Orthodox, right? Uniates, for the most part, are an exception to the rule of the, of the Latins. They, I don't know, I'm, I don't have a lot of experience, but my understanding is that they do try to keep the Trian tri immersion. Maybe they don't, I don't know, but that's what, at least back in the day, they did. And even so, St. Paisius said no. All, all of them need to be baptized. And so we'll, we'll look into that. Now, continuing in the tradition of St. Paisios and St. Nicodemus and the Colibar Fathers is the great new martyr of Russia, one of the stars in the firmament of Russian theology in the first 30 years, and that is St. Hilarion Trotsky. What I call, I call him a Russian Kolivadi's father. All right. Now, unfortunately, this is going to be a little difficult for some of you who don't have magnifying glass, but I'm going to be reading these things. You can go back and look at them. At another time, if you're on a phone, it'd be impossible for you to read, probably. But this is uh, from his Unity on the Church, and we're going to have to go through this quickly because we're already at almost two hours. But he talks about the events of Saint of, of Patriarch Kirill of 15, uh, 1756. Uh, he says, at the end of the 18th century, uh, in addition to that, he, he commemorates that, he says, the Greek rudder, the Pedalion, was compiled in which Latin baptism was named Pseudonymon baptisma, the a, a baptism falsely so called. I mean, literally, it's not a baptism, right? It's not. That's what he means. It's not an immersion. And the first canon of Saint Basil the Great, in his dogmatic part, is applied to the Latin hierarchy. Laicigia nomini, they become like laymen. Uh, and 
It is true that the decision of 756 was passed under extremely restless conditions of church life. And he goes and talks a little bit about that. Uh, but the circumstance does not change the fact that from the middle of the 18th century on, the Greeks began to baptize Latins. They, were, they returned to Acrivia. All right. So that's a little bit there, just a little uh, that he's totally historically in, informed, at least what's going on. Uh, it's my understanding he. He 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 was he read Greek and and had the medallion in mind. He goes on to say um, that for whole centuries. Now he's trying to explain to this Westerner. He's talking to a, an Anglican, and this is the, this is like 1912, 13, somewhere in there. This is the, just the beginning of the ecumenical movement, and he's and he's writing to an Anglican, and he's saying uh, that your version of ecclesiology is impossible. It's not orthodox. It's irreconcilable. And let me let me present you. All these events, he goes on and on and on, historical events and theological, uh, it's very well informed. Uh, and he says that there's only one conclusion you can come to. Let's listen and see what the conclusion he comes to, which is exactly that of the Kolivadi's fathers, with one small difference, a very important difference. We'll talk about that in a second. For whole centuries, the practice of the Eastern Church was diverse, wavering between baptism and chrismation. In there were different conciliar decisions were made, which also altered in various centuries. In 1484, the Greek church decreed that Latin should be chrismated, but at this same period, the Russian church more and more sanctioned the practice of baptism, confirming it later in the Council of 1620. So on the one hand, you have Greeks doing more chrismation, you have Russians doing more baptism, uh, and you know, for an outsider, this is, this, is, this is crazy. Well, why isn't there one approach? And he's gonna talk about why that's the case. And then in Russia, 47 years later, you have the influence of the Greeks and the Russian church then decrees that Latin should be chrismated. And even Lutherans later on in, in the 1700s should be chrismated. And even more so, they mitigate that practice and they allow them to come in uh, without chrismation, confession of faith. Uh, which he sees as a peculiarity in, in, in Russia, which is true. Uh, how is one to regard, regard all these historical facts? How must he think of them? And what attitude must he have, or I have, towards this as a member of my own church? I'm a priest of my church. Uh, can I admit that this practice is inseparably linked with a dogmatic understanding of the unity of the church? Does the reception of the Latin bat Latins without baptism mean that they are members of the same church to which I belong? But then how will I regard my church, which now recognizes Latins as her members possessing her gifts of grace, and then begins to baptize them like pagans and Jews? In other words, how, how, can, how can I say one thing and then a little, 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 later on they do the opposite? How can I talk about them being baptized with the one baptism and received in church? He's talking about the Western perception of things. Or what about St. Hermogenes, Hermogen, the Patriarch of Moscow, who received a martyr's death from the Latins when he demanded the baptism of Prince Vladislav. This was before the Westernization in Russia. And the, did he not, in spite of the 10th article of the symbol of faith, require a second baptism? So if you believe that, they, that Vladislav, the the papist, papal Protestant coming over uh, was already baptized, then what he was doing was sacrilege, right? He's saying you're going to require a second baptism. Obviously, he didn't believe that. He wouldn't be doing it. If the rebaptism of Latins was a second baptism, then do not hundreds of Orthodox hierarchs deserve to be deposed according to the 47th Apostolic Canon? So, um, there's there's no other option. If you do, if you believe that there is baptism outside the church as some state today, then you have to wish or hope for the, the deposition and defrocking of many, many, not only hierarchs or priests today, but saints throughout church history. <laughs> Saint Nicodemus should be defrocked um, and many others. I'm a little bit further down. If sacraments outside the church are valid and grace bestowing, one can only accept them. Then to change the practice of receiving converts, as did the Greeks and the Russians from the 11th century to the 18th century, means to blaspheme and to subject to be subject to anathema. All right. So 
So if, if that if there are valid and gross grace bestowing baptisms outside the church, then these people are blaspheming Saint Hermogen and Saint Nicodemus, and they're subject to anathema. But I cannot recognize my own church as having blasphemed or blaspheming. For this reason, one must seek explanation for the church practice in relation to the Latins only in the consideration of church economia and not in the dogmatically understand a dogmatic understanding of the unity of the church of christ all right so it's not on the level of ecclesiology it's only economy we've said this many times but it really needs to be driven home because people don't understand and they confuse things and they say immediately they run from pastoral economia to dogma and they try to make dogma on the basis of pastoral economia and it's, it's obviously not going to work. The, the Eastern Church, just as the ancient church, has not gone astray or erred. For although at times, for the sake of the profit of human souls, she has made a condescension by not requiring that a new rite of baptism be performed upon converting Latins. And here's the point where he differs. And I think he didn't deal with it. He didn't go into the writings of the Holy Bodies. He didn't have access to all their writings. Uh, even though their rite differs from the Orthodox in its external aspect sprinkling so he's saying he's saying essentially here that he's not making the distinction the holy father's fathers made on that particular point but as you read on you realize that in fact underlying that he realizes that this is a latin western innovation that's crept in and it is to be rejected listen to what he says the decisions of the church and authoritative church writers demanded the chrismation of Latins. Receiving Latins without chrismation is the only is only a local custom of the Russian church, which was introduced under the influence of the Trebnik of Peter Mogila, and was even prompted by the theological spirit of Catholicism itself. So he admits that this departure from chrismation to confession of faith, which was a, a total Latinization, but, he does, but but on the same ba on the same basis we have the same question of chrismation of baptism. So in principle, he, he, he understands the problem, but he doesn't apply it to the question of chrismation and baptism as the Holy Fathers did that we've read about today. Everything which is the sad result of the influence of Latin scholasticism in our theology cannot be, or, or of course, more authoritative than the teaching of the ancient church and the direct heir of her grace-filled gifts. Exactly. Uh, so what we're doing, though, in, in, in much of orthodoxy that's been affected by this, and unfortunately Russian orthodoxy, according to St. Hilarion, and, he's, and it's true to this day, has been heavily influenced by Latin scholasticism, on this point especially, and they're not giving due weight to the authoritative teaching of the ancient church and the heirs of the ancient church, which are the Kolibadis fathers and other saints. Uh, and there's nothing that this custom of which is essentially a custom theologically untenable that should not be rejected and reversed there's nothing that prevents the church today in russia and serbia or wherever it's happening to say we don't need to do this any longer custom is not above holy tradition is not above theology of the church not above ecclesiology and we need to rethink and reverse our practices and he goes on uh it is not a convincing fact that in the Eastern Church, it was always directed that Latins be received through chrismation, as Arians, Macedonians, and Apollinarians were received by the Eastern Church. Is that not a convincing fact? He's saying, look, he's talking about the ecclesiological aspect, right? He's not talking about economy and when it should or should not be applied. But he's saying the fact that we insist they be they received by like the Arians and Macedonians, doesn't that show that the church considers Latins just uh, not to be uh, members, but actually they're members just as much as the Arians and other heretics were members. In other words, not at all. Doesn't that show that? Our stance shows that. Uh, he talks about the um, exception of Mogila. And Mogila says in his Trebnik, he, he who dares to repeat these holy mysteries commits sacrilege and a second time crucifies and rails against Christ. As we've seen, though, in our presentation of the Holy Fathers, that that is an indictment on saints and councils because Trullo has both. Trullo has canons which insist on, on 
baptism and others that, that allow for chrismation. So this comment is obviously ignorant of holy tradition, and it's, and it's obviously influenced by Latin, Latin theology, which is ignorant of holy tradition as well. And he quotes Komiakoff, and with that, we're going to probably wrap it up. Um, and it's a, it's a good quote. Uh, it, doesn't, it doesn't necessarily address economia, but it's very interesting. Let's, let's read it. He says, local errors are not the errors of the church, but errors into which individuals can fall by ignorance or ecclesiastic, uh, of ecclesiastical rule. So a local error would be a, an error in the church of Serbia or Georgia or Russia or whatever, or, or Greece, uh, which is not a church, uh, an error of the church per se, but of, in a local community. The blame falls on the individuals, whether bishops or laymen, it doesn't matter. But the church herself stands blameless and pure, reforming local error, but never in need of reform. I could, I could add that in my opinion, even in this case, the church has never changed her doctrine and that there has only been a change in the rights without any alteration in their meaning. And this is exactly getting the point of explaining economia. All sacraments are completed only in the bosom of the true church, and it matters not whether they be completed in one form or another. So there are no mysteries outside the church. Reconciliation re renovates or renews, perhaps, I don't know what the Russian was there, uh, the sacraments or completes them, giving a full and orthodox meaning to the rite that was before either insufficient or heterodox, and the reception of the preceding sacraments is virtually contained in the rite or fact of reconciliation. Uh, that's that's one way to explain it. That's an attempt to explain it. And you see those attempts today. Interesting, though, that the canons don't try to explain it. So we don't have to explain it. And our attempt may or may not be successful. And it doesn't necessarily speak to the presuppositions of whether economy, right? We're not talking about economy and why and when it can be applied. We're trying to explain when it is. How might we understand it? Therefore, the visible repetition of baptism or confirmation, chrismation, though unnecessary, cannot be considered as erroneous and establishes only a ritual difference without any difference of opinion. This is somewhat clear. We're going to get into Father Florovsky and, and, and reply to him by Metropolitan uh, or Bishop Atarasi Yevtich. This is not too far away from what Yevtich is saying, actually. So it's interesting. Uh, he doesn't say it in the same way. And I think it's more preferable the way Yeftis does, but uh, it's interesting that they're close. You will understand my meaning more clearly still by a comparison with another fact in ecclesiastical history. And here's a very interesting comparison. The church considers marriage as a sacrament and yet admits married heathens into a community without remarrying them. The conversion itself gives the sacramental quality to the preceding union without any repetition or right. Again, this is Komikov's explanation. I have never seen any theological justification for it, uh, but I do believe that he's right. This is what the church has been doing and does generally. But listen to what he says, goes on to say, though. It's very interesting. This you must admit, unless you admit an impossibility, that is, that the sacrament of marriage was by itself complete in the lawful union of a heathen pair. So he's saying, obviously, the sacrament of marriage doesn't exist among the heathens. So what's happening when they're not married in the church after they, they are baptized, chrismated, and communed? Why aren't they married? Well, the church says that through these mysteries, the, the, this union that they've had humanly is now blessed by God and it becomes a three-part union, right, with Christ uniting them. Uh, and he says the church does not remarry heathens or Jews. Now, would it be an error to remarry them? Would it be an error to remarry them in the church? Certainly not, he says, though the right would seem altered. So that's a good example of what the church does, the economy the church works. Nobody among the anti polivadis groups or the humanists or the uh, people who want to see mixed marriages, nobody would say the church should have and should universally do the marriage ceremony for all these converts, right? I don't think anybody's saying that. They, they, would, they would tend not to want to say that. Uh, and yet the church can and does, without any problem, marry them in the church. And I think that's actually preferred in these days 
of apostasy. That's what should be happening. I think it's a good thing for all converts after they're baptized, chrismated, and communed. That same day, they should be married in the church. That would be the ecclesia. That would be the best uh, because of the massive apostasy today and the, and the situation in the world, that's going to be the, the, the safest, most blessed route, I personally believe. But you see how that works, though, in that in the context of marriage. And now he goes on. As you can see, Komiakov expresses almost the same thing, which was, in my opinion, the constant mind of the church. Many are prevented from understanding this, though, uh, this thought by the medieval Latin doctrine of the sacraments, according to which sacraments can be performed even outside the one body of Christ, outside the one church. This is exactly right. St. Hilarion comes and tells us, look at you Orthodox, uh, all of you Orthodox who are thinking in this Latin way. You can't understand what Komiakov, what the Kolivadi fathers are saying, because you're immersed in this Latin post-schism idea of the mysteries. You have to throw that off. And you need to embrace what the Holy Fathers are teaching here. So next lesson, we'll get to Father George Florovsky. Uh, and we're going to be talking about the House of the Father and an article by Atharis Yeptich in response to his Boundaries of the Church, Limits of the Church article. We'll look at that as well. That'll be the first thing we'll do in the next lesson next week. Very important for our contemporary situation. So that's the end of Lesson 7. Thank you for your patience. We went a whole hour and 45 minutes here lecture. So God bless you for your patience. I hope it's beneficial uh, and you've gotten a good dose of what the Holy Fathers are teaching. Let's go to our questions and see what they have to say. Uh, where are we now? All right, question number one. Father Luke, Father Peter of Legite, would you please address the economia we exercise in clinical baptisms where out of necessity we baptize as best we can, almost never by immersion, in a few supater. Well, I think it was addressed by economos, uh, that that is a totally different situation. First of all, it's in the church. Secondly, uh, if, uh, if it, it's an emergency, so we're not talking about a norm. We're not talking about a practice that is considered acceptable. Uh, so if spur, immer, the sprinkling or even air baptism, all those things are done because there's no other way, no other possibility. And so by this economia, uh, the, the church uh, blesses that. But it has nothing to do with this question at all uh, of economia and the reception of converts. Uh, so this... The, this is oftentimes the case. People will point to exceptions like the Didache, and they'll say, well, nah, Didache, so there, it doesn't matter. You can pour. But that's not the mind of the fathers. It's not the mind of the Holy Father's fathers. They never would accept that. Uh, the, the, those, those exceptions, they say very clearly, are not the, do not become the rule. They are not precedents. Uh, they cannot be uh, understood in that way. Uh, in, in, in terms of, in my understanding in Greece anyway, if, so, if a baby is baptized uh, and then lives, baptized in an emergency way, air or sprinkling, the, then the whole mystery is performed by a priest after that. That's my understanding. Uh, I know in other places that everything but the actual baptism is performed. I'm not sure. Uh, but you can see the church doesn't want to just remain there. They want to do the whole service. They want to have the whole service uh, solidified by the priest. Uh, and it's very, very much in the thinking of the Holy Father's Fathers that the priest is essential for the mystery. They do not talk about laymen baptizing ever. Uh, and I don't really think that's a part of the holy tradition, except in, again, in extreme circumstances uh, when there's no other option. So uh, hopefully that answers your question. Let's go on. Is this not the same patriarch Cyril that some Western academics consider a Calvinist? No, that's a different uh, person entirely. Uh, what is the response the faithful give to this accusation? Uh, well, there is uh, plenty of evidence to say that he he is not behind that text. Finally, uh, you're talking about um, Lucaris, and this is not Lucaris. Uh, this is a different uh, uh, patriarch, um, Saint uh, Patriarch Curiel. Uh, we understand that the ecumenist expression of "we know where the church is, not where it is not." However, what about the other saying that is often used, which is, we know where the Holy Spirit is, not where it is not. Okay, that's a good question. I appreciate that. Thank you. So, uh, okay, we don't need to address that again. We've already addressed it, where the church is. We, we know where it is. We know where the church is not, because that's obviously 
erroneous. What about the Holy Spirit? Yeah, the Holy Spirit works throughout all creation. We've talked about this before, but it, it bears repeating. The Holy Spirit is the, the divine energies of, of God are, are in the pro providence of God, in the, 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 the holding together of all creation. Uh, everything that, that, that is good and, 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 and for the benefit, enlightenment of man in a, in, in, in a human way, not in terms of baptism, but all enlightenment that man receives, all of it is by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit, God, chases every human being to bring him to salvation. Every step that a that a inquirer is taking is 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 by the grace of the Holy Spirit to bring him to Christ. Every prayer uh, that is said by anyone in the name of Christ is by the Holy Spirit. Now, the difference here is that this is according to Saint Diabolos uh, of before baptism, and we've just got done talking about why baptism doesn't exist out there in Southern Church. I don't want to repeat that. So baptism is when one enters the Orthodox Church and only when one enters the Orthodox Church. So before baptism, meaning outside the church, among all the non-Orthodox, the Holy Spirit is outside of the inner man. And that and that change and the and and the and the passions and the demons are allowed to possibly dwell within, depending on the person's life. I mean, the passions are not overcome without baptism and the mysteries, uh, but uh, the the demons have access. After baptism, the demons are outside and the Holy Spirit dwells within. So that's the demarcation line. Uh, doesn't mean that the Holy Spirit doesn't exist outside the church and uh, doesn't doesn't work for the salvation of the world and doesn't doesn't bring about people uh, inspiring people to follow Christ. But following Christ and putting on Christ are two different things. The one presupposes the other, but without baptism and in baptism, one is not putting on Christ, being transfigured, being renewed uh, internally, the inner man, the kingdom of God coming to dwell within, and all the rest that comes after baptism with all the other mysteries and life in the church. So, uh, so you can see the clear difference. So we know where the Holy Spirit is. We don't not, we don't know where it is not. And that also needs to be unpacked. What do they mean by that? They mean the divine energies of purification, illumination, deification. No, we know where those are. Those have prerequisites. They have presuppositions, and they're in the church. And only those in the church uh, can enjoy the, 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 the divine energies, the, the presence of God that is purifying, illuminating, and deifying. Because it requires our free will, our, our, our um, uh, acceptance and uh, of, of baptism and of the mysteries or embrace and all the rest are, are free uh, uh, coming to and embracing the faith. All those things are presupposed. So if they mean we know where the Holy Spirit is working to purify, illumine, and deify, but we don't know where it is not, that's not true. If they mean we know where the Holy Spirit is working, uh, what else could they mean? Uh, we, we know it works in the church, but we don't know where it works outside the church. Well, we know it works outside the church, but we know and we know how it works outside the church. That's that the patristic mind that has spoken of this. We, we, we're not in darkness. So I think that's also problematic, and it would need to be unpacked. You need to ask the person, what do you mean? What do you mean by the Holy Spirit where it is not? Do you mean that the life of Christ in the church is possible outside the church? Is that what you're implying? And and then one would have to kind of flesh that all, all out, that thinking. Uh, my guess is most people don't think very deeply about the implications, and they state these things because they seem to, well, they see God's hand in creation, they see God's hand in people's lives, and so they say, well, God, of course, is working in all of, all of creation among all people. Of course he is. Who would, God, if he's not, then we would no longer exist, we would no longer have uh, any good at all. So nobody's doubting that, but what is the nature of that life outside the church and then inside the church? That's where people need to possibly go deeper. Another question. So there's always an, an, a pastoral exceptions for ministering baptism. Uh, no, we just got done explaining that there are presuppositions and the Holy Father said that where there's no form and type preserved, there can be no pastoral economia. So it, there are presuppositions, they have to be met. So I'm not sure what you're getting at. Let's see what else you have to say. What are the important considerations that clergy need to go through thoroughly before he makes a pastoral decision? 
there must be ecclesiological, theological, and sociological considerations. Which of these considerations are, has priority when considering an exercise of economy and not giving a baptism? So economy, again, according to St. Basil, is anekantopolon, it's for the many. And economy in the examinations of St. Nicodemus, he's referring consistently to a macro level. The church had this stance for these reasons because of the numbers, because of the power of the world, because of the situation. It's I, You don't hear it and see it applied, and I, I don't see it. I mean, maybe there are some exa examples, but of saints saying in one case where somebody wants to be a Christian, that they intentionally chrismate. That just doesn't happen, and that shouldn't happen, according to the teachings of the Kodivadis Fathers. So in today's situation, do we have any mass returns of people and they won't come and we maybe they'll walk away from the church and therefore they'll be lost unless we economize. There's some overarching pastoral urgency for the sake of a large number of people and therefore we're doing this economy for the sake of... I really don't think that that exists. And, uh, and if it did exist in a few cases in the 80s and 90s, my guess is that, I don't know, but I would an attempt could have been made for proper catechism and explanation of why they, they need to be baptized. I know one large group was baptized uh, by uh, Father Herman at the St. at the Saint Herman of Alaska Monastery in, uh, what was it, 90 or 89, 90, 91. Uh, and they were in many hundreds, if not over a thousand. And so the context is that. Now, if you're talking just, just generally about pastoral exceptions that's a whole different issue another time to talk about it where, where, where the priest would do economy on, on a micro level for for people who are already in the church they're confessing to them that's a different thing entirely uh another question isn't baptism also when we get our own guardian angel yes if we skip baptism do we skip that too not receive the guardian angel well the church in the holy fathers that are talking about economy they're saying that the, the actual event of immersion as the church does it is taking place and only then can they economize. So the physical end of things is, is, is happening according to Orthodox teaching. And then when they come to the church, that's, that, that what's missing was the giving of the Holy Spirit, the purification. And so the two are married as it were in the church and they're fulfilled. And so that we wouldn't consider them unbaptized. That's exactly the problem that the Quoted Fathers are bringing up. They're saying, look, when they, when the heretics or the heterodox depart from Orthodox baptism, we have no surety and no reason to believe that our economy is actually going to achieve the same result. That's why the fathers insist on baptism, because they've undermined even the external right. And that's really all we're taking from them. They don't have the faith. They don't have the Holy Spirit outside the church. What is what is coming from heterodoxy is only the external right. So if the external right is there, economy is possible. If it's not, it's, it's not possible. That's, in a nutshell, the stance of the Holy Fathers. And that's why people on Athos, fathers on Athos, are insisting on baptism today because they say, according to, following the Holy Fathers, fathers, they're not... Um, they're not uh, able to do that. They're not. It's not salvific. It's not beneficial. There's there's a problem uh, spiritually, and so uh, and they and some of them, uh, the charismatic the, the 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 charismatic elders, see that literally see that problem in some people. So hopefully I, I've I've given you the answer you're looking for. Uh, let's see. I've heard that some priests don't want to baptize converts because they themselves were received without being baptized. Are those priests' ordinations legitimate? So that would be tragic, and I, but I, I don't doubt that that's the case in some, some, some priests. Um, that would be a tragic, tragic thing if that were the case. Uh, uh, the ordinations are another issue entirely because the, this is the church ordaining someone to serve the mysteries, but the mysteries are not dependent upon the person. 
Christ is the one who is given and given every in every mystery within the church. So I think there's less grounds to doubt, and I don't have any reason to doubt the the ordinations and the divine liturgies served by priests who have not been properly received. I believe in the economy of God. I believe in the mercy of God, and so I don't. I don't, from my vantage point, see any reason to call that into question. Now I'm not a charismatic elder. I don't see things spiritually, and I have heard stories of the people going to charismatic elders and, and receiving more, a more, um, how can we say, polemical answer to that question. But you'll have to go to them and get that that answer if you can find them today. They're few and far between, but uh, uh, that is uh, that is sobering, to say the least. When I heard stories like that, it's very sobering. Um, but I again, I think ultimately we have little choice but to, to, to rely on the mercy and grace of God and love of God uh, and, uh, and simply leave it to God's providence and his judgment uh, in those cases. Work very hard for the church to follow the Koliva, these fathers, and return in mass across the board to Akrivia for the sake of the church's upbuilding and salvation of souls and also to put an end to this, this um, departure and this, this lack of clarity on the part of uh, the church today. Uh, I have another question. Am I in a position <clears throat> to man the priest of my local church to baptize me? What should I do if he refuses to do it? Yeah, I've, I've got this question a lot today, uh, lately. And, you know, normally in normal circumstances, the, the inquirer or the catechumen does not tell the priest how he's received, obviously, right? So it's a good question. And yet after hearing, I think, all of the Father, the Holy Father's words, it's not hard to see that we have a departure today and that, the departure, as Icon almost says, raises questions that are very dangerous spiritually for those who've departed and are being brought in in a way that's not according to the Holy Fathers and the canons and all the rest. So in that setting, I would say to, I would say to people who, who are told a refused baptism, I just cannot, I cannot accept that that's even a possibility. I don't understand how it's possible. On what basis would a bishop or a priest tell anyone that they cannot be baptized? Uh, when it's clear economia is something determined out of necessity for, for a large group of people, usually that's the case in, in church history. Uh, and there's 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 criteria that's followed, and there's a necessity, there's a there's an urgent necessity or something that's pushing the church to do that for the sake of the salvation. Because otherwise they would not, they, that's the thinking of the fathers, otherwise they would not be received. They would not come to the faith. They would not become Orthodox. If somebody's already wanting to be Orthodox and is begging for baptism, why would you not allow them to be baptized? It's absolutely unheard of and unconscionable. So I guess I would say I couldn't tell you not to be not to insist uh, and, and, to, and, to, and, to find you, and to follow the Holy Fathers. I mean, what else can I tell you? Follow the Holy Fathers. Um, remission of sins or forgiveness of sins, what is the better translation? Well, I think forgiveness is, is more complete, um, but they're both acceptable. But in English, I think forgiveness would be preferable because sin is a missing of the mark. Forgiveness is uni unity. Ultimately, it's coming back into synchronicity in Greek is to be back in the same place with God, to be unified, to be in communion with him. Sin is missing that mark. The mark is communion, right? Salvation is communion. So when you sin and you, you have those forgiven, you are in forgiveness, you are united to God. So that would be the, that would be the, re the reconciliation or the undoing of sin would be communion. And so I think forgiveness is closer. To the Greek, I have a family member who was received into orthodoxy through chrismation, but not baptism. How should I ask them, recommend to them they should receive an orthodox baptism? You know, people are going to be asking me this. Obviously, you know, with what I'm talking talking about and presenting the Holy Fathers, 
there's going to be all kinds of implications for people who have been received by cremation. I can't. I have to present the Holy Fathers. I feel, and yet I cannot answer for everybody and everyone in every circumstance. I think you need each one of us needs to pray deeply, seek and, and seek out the Holy Fathers, seek out the Holy uh, um, to follow the Holy Fathers, seek out a spiritual father or someone who's in the traditional Holy Fathers in the monasteries, wherever it might be, whatever priest it might be, and 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 work out their the salvation in the in fear and trembling and 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 it's very hard for me to get into all these circumstances and say, well, yeah, you should you should do X, you should do Y in terms of how to go about now uh, having heard all this, what do I do? I mean, that's it, it's a good question. It's a logical question. But I don't know if I can really answer them uh, in a macro way. It's really, it's really uh, I think, unwise probably to try to do that. Um, so I don't know what to recommend to them. I think they, they need to come to it on their own. Maybe you can recommend them to watch this series. Uh, and then and then go and pray pray about it and then ask God and ask the spiritual father uh, for how they might follow the holy fathers on this and, and embrace the uh, the akrivia of the church and how that's going to be accomplished uh, I really cannot tell you uh, what would you say to those teachers of canon law who say that if one has had holy communion then it completes anything that was missing holy baptism just asking for a friend yeah I I don't. I don't think that's true. We have these mysteries. <laughs> they need to be. They need to be carried out. I mean, that's a krivia. That's exactitude. Uh, that is uh, sounds sounds uh, hard to support. Why would we? Why would we put those things away when we can administer them? Uh, I think I've read you the the case of Saint Formilian, uh, who disagreed with Saint Dionysius of Alexandria, who said he would not baptize someone who came crying, asking for baptism years after they had been received in the church because they realized that the baptism they received as in the, among the heterodoxes was totally foreign to orthodoxy. And he said, no. Uh, and that's one answer. Uh, and St. Familiar gave another answer. St. Familiar said, no, I was wrong. He should have baptized him and all of them should be baptized. Uh, and, uh, and they're going to basically depart as catechumens is what St. Familiar said. So there's two, there's, there's both answers in the church. Um, uh, but, uh, uh i would i would lean toward what the holy fathers and monathos are doing today and that is when they see someone who's been in the church even has been five ten years doesn't matter but they've been received without any justification without any of the presuppositions being filled they baptize them that's what they do in monathos and they don't they don't they don't see that they're going to undo anything or 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 or, or disdain anything that they've done in the church for the last 10 or 15 or five years or whatever it might be. Uh, God, after all, is above all his creation. He's above all his commandments. He's outside of time. Uh, and so he sees, obviously, you know, um, following the Holy Father teaching, this would be an error. And therefore, uh, I don't think he's going to be upset if it's corrected. I can't imagine him being, and neither would he have a problem to reconcile that with the, the this order that we have in this world. We have an order in this world, God ordained it, it's, it's blessed, but for God, outside of time, is that really an obstacle, or is that for our benefit, the order of things? Uh, so that would be my answer on that. Uh, now we're at two, two hours and 33 minutes. Didn't get to the questions over at, over at uh, our friends at uh, uh, Crowdcast, but we'll get to you on, um, on Thursday. So God bless you. Uh, all of you, I hope this has been a very helpful lesson in getting into the nitty and gritty of the uh, church fathers and how they worked out all these uh, questions of uh, church history, canons, and all the rest. Uh, it's It certainly should serve you going forward uh, in terms of discerning. Uh, when you hear about all these issues, you'll be discerning on the basis of hopefully the Holy Fathers here that have been presented to others how to understand the ecumenist ecclesiology that's being promoted uh, and, and being accepted by many people in the church today and how to deal with it. All right, so next week, oh, I, I did not put this up and I should have. That should have been there the whole time. But next week we're going to be dealing with 
the writings of St. Eustin Povich, Father Florovsky, I'll be looking at, St. Eustin Povich, Vladimir Lasky, and Alexander Schmemann, all right? And uh, uh, you can ask, you can bring questions if you didn't get them today. Uh, I think there's gonna be a really interesting lecture uh, on some of these 20th century uh, saints and theologians. Uh, and they've delved into a lot of these issues, so it'll be very interesting. So we'll look forward to that. See you on Thursday if you're in Patreon, and we'll see you on next Tuesday uh, if you're not. God bless you. We'll chant the Troparian. <laughs>